right, this is the September 16th meeting of the fire station building committee. Um, we have one last architect to interview tonight, Tecton, um, and then we'll be voting, or I guess starting the voting process to we finish. Um, first agenda item, we'll open up for public comment. Zoom. So we'll go. What's that? So we go get them. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so agenda item number two, please conduct interviews for a designer for the fire station project. So like I said, we have Tecton tonight. I think John is going to get them right now. We'll be on our way. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you want, you can take care of them now. You can move it up. People want to that beforehand or wait till end. Well, if he's going to bring him in right now. Yeah, last sure. Last week. The other night. Oh, yeah. Let's That's be careful. Okay. It, it may have time. Um, your IT but guy turned everything on. Yeah, but that one goes to sleep. Remember? Sure. I just have to, to walk, plug walk, I have to block that one because somebody oh. programmed the remote yeah. to hit. Oh, good. Phone. So if I turn this one back on, that, that one's going to go off. Yeah. How does one block the. Just walk over to it. Okay. I think you can do it from this remote here. I'm sorry. It's on. It's on. Telling everybody I'm going to stand. We're going to say lots of So if you want to get set up, I'll kind of say a few words to, to start us off and then turn it over to you. How sensitive are these? Should I pull this down? Please use them, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Unless we, you're standing, um, use the handhelds. Yeah. Just because it helps people who are at home on YouTube or Zoom. You won't hear yourself or it, or it get louder, but it helps, in the, room, helps in the room back there. Oh, it is on. Yep. We're getting a thumbs up from the booth. Um, <laughs> so you're good? I'm gonna take, I'm gonna keep this on over here. Okay. So welcome. Thanks for, for coming out tonight and meeting with us. Um, so, this project really kind of stretches back a few years, as, as you might know. It was originally part of a, a public safety project that was kind of in two, two parts. First part was to move the police facility to another part of the town and then to, to renovate or replace the fire station. Fortunately, the police station ran its complications, so there really wasn't sufficient funds remaining to keep the, the fire station project going at that time. Um, we still have enough funds to, to get us through design, but not enough to take us through construction, um, which is really where the, the designer's gonna come in to get us over the finish line and kind of get this through construction. Um, so we've, we've taken kind of our first big step and gotten an OPM on board, and we're looking to take that next, next big step and get the right designer on board. So uh, that being said, I'll go around the room and we can all introduce ourselves. I'm Kevin Champagne. The, I'm a structural engineer by trade. Hi, I'm John Kent. I'm an energy project manager for the state. I'm Justin Janosik. I'm a firefighter. Uh, Chris Baker, a civil and geotech engineer by trade. Aaron Hunt, uh, architect. Blythe Robinson, I'm the town administrator. Uh, Aaron Kinney, I'm the fire chief. John Levy from Vertex. Steve Kirby for Vertex. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I th I'm sure John probably mentioned to you, we're, we're trying to limit your introduction to 20 minutes. We have a lot of good questions, so I think we'll kind of be able to expand on what you what you brought. I know 20 minutes is a little short. But when the timer goes off, don't be shocked. Well, yeah. this. No. No. Don't worry. I'll, I'll give you the five when there's five left. All right. All right. So it's all yours. All right. I, I, I'm going to stand up just because I have all sorts of nervous energy when I'm. Sure. When I'm presenting, and it helps me keep it under control. But my name is Jeff McElravey, principal with Tecton Architects. And with me today, I have a whole bunch of folks. Matt, why don't you go ahead? 
Oh, I'm uh, Matt Salad with Tecton Architects. I'm a project architect. Uh, I've been working with Jeff on public safety projects for about 10 years now. Rebecca Hopkins, also with Tecton Architects, um, project manager, also been working with Jeff for over 10 years now. And I'm Kevin McGarry. I'm a project manager at Fuss and O'Neill. We do site civil engineering, landscape architecture, geotech, traffic, environmental remediation, hazardous materials. Which is why I had you sit down by the <laughs> 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 One of the things that's really important for our team is that we work with uh, consultants that we know well, that we work well together with, and that have a commitment to deliver service to our client. That's particularly important to me. And so the rest of our team that's flushed out, uh, H2M Pachika Ross, um, they're fire medics, fire specialists that we work with uh, frequently. Um, it's, it's a good gut check, and it's uh, make sure that we get all the details right. Dennis Ross is a very good friend of mine. and. Uh, we do a lot of work together, so it's, it's always a pleasure to have them on the team. Um, CES, who's not represented here tonight, uh, is our mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection engineers. Uh, we work with them very, very often on a lot of different projects, but particularly on the public safety projects. It, Kevin mentioned the Fuss and O'Neill connection there, Johnson Structural Engineering, uh, one of the many structural engineers, or actually a few of the structural engineers we work with, and then A.M. Fogarty. Um, we work with a couple different cost estimators. Um, it varies with how their workload's going and how, how quickly they can respond. And right now, AM Fogarty's been doing right by us, and so we feel good about having them on the team because we feel good about their estimates. As you can see from the map, and you've already seen from the, the, the proposal that we sent in, whoa, that was interesting. There's a lot of public safety experience on the team. Um, if you read deep enough, um, you know that I've been doing public safety now for uh, 35 years or so um, with another firm before Tecton and then uh, the last 15, 16 years, uh, coming on 16, uh, with Tecton. Um, and that's the, the vast majority of the work I would call police and fire work. Uh, this is a little bit of our recent experience uh, going back to uh, Wilbraham, Massachusetts, where uh, Chief Fran Note said, uh, they had money for a new fire, a uh, new ladder truck for, for, for the fire department. And Fran said to the select board, he says, you know, I, I could make my ladder glass, what I really need is a building. And so they ended up hiring us and we did a study for them and they said, uh, we, we figured out what they could afford to build for the money of the ladder truck. And then they said, what could you afford to, or what would it cost to build everything they need? And we told them the number and we ended up doing that. Um, one important thing is they had a really great asset in an existing building that was awesome. My structural engineer went out to do the review of that building uh, when the microburst following the tornado that hit the Springfield area happened. He came out saying, yeah, the building's good. <laughs> uh, North Brookfield, we've done a lot of work. We did the police station there. We just recently did a study for the fire station. Unfortunately, they got kicked behind the line to the DPW facility, so they'll be coming along in a little while. Natick, we were out there this morning. Uh, wrapping up construction on that. Lexington, Mass, uh, it, that's, it's such a, a pride and joy. It was, it was a very complex fire station project with a, with a demanding client, and uh, the results are fantastic. And I think Matt gets a chance to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, we just did some work from Charlton on a public safety building. Um, we're actually returning to Lexington right now with the police station. Um, we're doing a big study in Auburn, Massachusetts, so right now we've been looking for sites to locate a big public safety building for them. And then Munson Fire, uh, we hope to go to town meeting. Uh, they want to go in the spring, so we're going to do some publication from now until then um, to get that fire station project going as well. So one thing with all of that experience that we like to bring to the table is fire medic specifics. Um, and it's really right sizing those to your department operations. Everything from contamination control, so our hot zones and cold zones, ensuring that um, any of your apparatus bay um, air isn't um, getting into your living quarters. Um, we also talk about all of the equipment that needs to be handled within all of those different spaces. Um, so it's really an all-inclusive, fully integrated solution. Um, we have all those players on board from day one, from programming, so that we can ensure that's all written in. Um, we also look for opportunities from a training standpoint. Um, Building those apparatus bays, they're naturally taller than all of our other spaces, so we look for mezzanine and internal training opportunities, so you can do some training exercises within the bays, but also any external props that you'd be looking to incorporate and integrate. Um, so not only from an interior, but exterior standpoint, but a fully integrated solution um, upon delivery. 
So when, and whenever a community starts a project, you know, everybody's all good about the what. You know, what are we going to do? We're going to build a fire station. And they talk about, well, how are we going to do it? You know, going through the process, making sure you get the OPMs and the architects on board. But the really important question is the why. I think this comes from uh, one of those... Uh, Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek, yes, talks about knowing your why. Um, but it's really, it really is important to, to know what the why is. What's driving? What are the root issues that are driving you towards this need? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I don't know what all your whys are yet. Um, we read a little bit about uh, what's happened to you in the past, but we don't know what's, you know, all the drivers that's heading you to this project. I can tell you a little bit about what our why is, why we do what we do. And we believe that every public safety officer deserves a, you know, deserves a facility that enhances their operation and respects the service they provide to their community. That's a big deal with us. Matt came to me one day some time ago saying, I want to do architecture that matters to people. And so we started doing public safety with us. Um, every community deserves a well-designed uh, facility that represents their civic identity. I've been this a while. You know, I designed buildings that, you know, I liked a lot. But a long time ago, I learned that I'm building a building for a community. It's your building. It's not mine. And you guys need to be proud of it at the end. And that's more important about, well, I like to be proud too. But it's more important than whether I'm proud or not. You need to, you need to believe in what you built and that every civic dollar should be invested wisely. I'm careful about the wording of this. I'm not saying you, you, it should be spent cheaply on cheap product. I'm saying wisely. You want to get the best value out of the dollars you spend. And of course, when we understand all of that and we work together in partnership, we can, we can build on the talent and knowledge that everybody brings to the equation, not only on our side of the table, but on your side of the table. And at the end, we can, there we go. <laughs> We can come up with a project and support the need and create community understanding because at the end of the day, community buy-in is essential to making sure that you get the funding approval. And so we need to make sure that we're designing something that's appropriate for the community as well as for functional needs. So a little bit about our process and when we start this programming phase, it's really, um, it's heavy data and heavy dialogue. Um, so we'll look at all research and programming that you've done in the past. We know that there has been um, previous space needs assessments. We've already taken a look at them and we'll continue to look at any information you give us. Um, we'll verify any of that information provided, whether it be uh, building drawings or anything like that. Um, but then really we want to talk to you during that programming phase and really understand exactly how your department is functioning. Um, so we, we explore your wants, your needs, we immediately talk about budget. The minute we put that program on paper, the minute we have a square footage, we're gonna start talking about average square foot costs and what that could possibly mean from a big picture standpoint so we can work tighter into what the budget needs to, to actually become. Um, so really, um, this is a living document. It's not necessarily something that happens and then is put aside and it's set in stone. Um, as we go through the process, we continuously tweak and modify that document so it's a, a good representation of exactly what the department needs. Um, from a building standpoint. So I just uh, returned back from Missouri where uh, Rebecca and I both spoke at the station design conference and the, the topic we talked about there was making sure that you get every square foot you need and need every square foot you get. And I can't give you the whole presentation because you only get 20 minutes, but, <laughs> but the important thing here is understanding what is your value equation. There are lots of things that you can do with your new station. And they're in competition with, with each other because they all cost money. And so identifying what your priority values are is incredibly important at the beginning of the programming exercise. Because, you know, we go through the programming exercise, you ask for a lot of things, and we, we quantify what the square footage is of those things and tell you what the total square footage is. But then you need to go and optimize your program based on what that value equation is. If training is the most important thing, your program should represent it. If community outreach is the most important thing, your program should represent that. So if that means that we give a little bit in office space so that we make sure that we're representing those important values, that's the way, that's the way you get to a success at the end. You've got to have a litmus test for testing. What's the value of what we're putting on paper here? What's the value of the programmatic elements? Um, you, uh, your space needs assessment that we read before says that you have about 22,000 square feet of need and then in the RFP it said about uh, 16,000 square foot of needs. That's a big difference. Um, you know, I think that if you, if you look at the, you know, obviously there's a mathematical equation that has to do with the square footage cost, but the real mathematical equation that's important is understanding how do we get that great value out of the square footage you build. 
and then figuring out how it fits into that budget equation. So uh, that's really important. So another thing, once we kind of go through, um, to continue through our process, once we kind of created a program, we start to visualize design and to record what we're visualizing or what we're creating, you guys can all understand. Um, that allows for full team buy-in um, and also allows for us to have a reason behind every decision made from a design standpoint. This can be everything from quick block diagrams on a site plan just to show you exactly where the apparatus base would be located, what the response routes would look like, where the public groups would be on site, um, to exploded exonometrics to even walkthroughs. Everything we do today is innately three-dimensional and we love to leverage that. We know what three feet looks like on a drawn floor plan, but we look at drawings all day, every day. That's our job. So what we'd like to do is leverage the 3D model and allow you to kind of walk through the spaces, visualize the spaces, and that way we can get much um, more effective feedback and say that space doesn't work. Um, I need this to be over here. Um, I'm gonna have issues with response from my living quarters to get to the apparatus bay. I see challenges in that. That allows us for the, the, the most optimum solution that we all buy into. The third kind of component of that process is then, once we've all bought into that design, is how do we create a community understanding for the ask? Um, so that is really an education and not a sell. Um, we can tailor this to the community, whether you have want us to do public presentations, whether there are um, pre-existing events that you want us to attend. Um, we, Jeff and I just attended a um, national night out for a fire department. They were doing a cook-off with the police department. We had boards of the new fire station, um, and it was really well received because there was a lot of the community present. Um, and this can be from anything to let's take all the data and all of the equipment that we need to house and break that down into a tangible, uh, understandable um, framework that the community can get behind. Um, or it can be, hey, we have a community component of this building and we want your feedback, we want your input. Um, we had a project where we had were able to incorporate a small pocket park um, and we wanted the community to tell us, what do you want as a part of this pocket park? Um, or if there's a community training room, um, this is the opportunity to bring the community into the station. Um, also let them know schedule, when's the ask gonna be? Um, so that's not a surprise. Um, and then also just so that they understand the overall design. So a lot of what we do also is about integrated quality and, and, and that goes all the way from our design process and, and the way that we communicate with you folks, but also the way that we develop our contract documents and how we coordinate with the contractor. We wanna make sure that we're putting together a really tight set of, set of documents that, that you all understand as, as far as what's going into them so that when the contractor buys them, we're not getting surprises. The last thing we want is chief for you to be there halfway through construction and say, this isn't what I thought this was gonna look like because that's gonna be an expensive change order for us to fix or you're gonna be living with that issue for the rest of, rest of the life of the facility. So we wanna make sure we're taking that in dialogue and, make, and getting it into our construction documents clearly and well illustrated and then we wanna make sure that everything is, is followed straight through through bidding so that the contractor knows exactly the scope that we're doing and we wanna make sure that that everything's getting built exactly as, as we've drawn it. And we do that a number of ways. One, we're all talking to, to each other on a daily basis. We have weekly coordination meetings. We actually, we all get together actually after hours and talk about ways that we can do our work better, communicate better, especially when we're going through like the pandemic over the past year. We've completely told the way we put our contract documents together and the way that we coordinate in a way that's been much more effective. Um, we also have another principal in charge in, in the front, not just Jeff, but his counterpart. In every phase of the project, he puts an independent set of eyes on those documents to make sure that they're meeting our standards um, for those contract documents before they go out. And then we're utilizing all of our technologies. You know, everything's modeled in 3D. You saw how that, that image went from, from the 3D view into, into what it looks like in reality. Making sure every trade and every component is modeled accurately and with intent ensures that it gets built exactly as we intended it. So really quickly, um, a couple of case studies here. Uh, the, the one I talked about earlier with the, uh, with the afterburst of the tornado is over on the left of Wilbraham. You can see that uh, little purple area in the middle there. That's the, the existing fire station and we ended up building all around it. Uh, the interesting thing here is that they, uh, uh, we had to evacuate the fire station uh, during construction. And so they had a substation, so they relocated operations over to the substation. And you know, they ended up putting a lot of the vehicles outside during that construction period. Uh, Chief Note tells me that during the winter they ran the trucks <laughs> to keep them warm. 
Um, it's a challenging prospect, but you know that's how they managed the cost and kept the, kept the, uh, the, the department operating. Different on Natick. Yeah, so on Natick, um, it was new construction on the existing site. So what we worked with is, instead of the example that Jeff just talked to, where there was an, an addition renovation, they were able to maintain operations, function off of the site while we built the new station. They were then swung into the new station, and then we proceeded to demo the existing station. Um, so that was a slightly different solution, um, but still uh, response was key. Um, but also, um, there was a lot of conversations at the beginning of the design process about how can we control the cost? of any temporary facilities that are necessary. And in their case, we could build and control our scope of work to allow them to maintain operation. And there was no temporary cost. You know, Jeff just gave an example about the ad reno. There was minor, because they were utilizing facilities that they had um, at their disposal. Um, and then Matt is gonna speak to an example that was slightly different, where they actually did do offsite swing space. So Lexington, Massachusetts, and Jeff had mentioned we had recently finished the fire station there <laughs> and we're currently designing the police station. But what we had to do is, um, they actually were able to get an old um, bank headquarters, Liberty Bank headquarters, and use that as a swing space. So we put a temporary tent apparatus bay on the back of the site, which is still there now and will be used by the police department. We renovate that. And then renovated the bank into a temporary fire headquarters. So we swung them out, demoed the old building, and then built the new. And the interesting thing about, about this building is, um, it's also a super high performing um, building, very energy efficient. Everything's designed at a minimum of 30% above code, um, lead silver. Um, it's the, one of the first apparatus space ever to pass a blower door test and had the first um, heat pump all electric um, radiant floor heating system ever installed in a fire station in the world. At the same time, while being hyper modern and hyper high performing, it's also fitting in one of the most historic districts that there is in Massachusetts. Um, and so there was a lot of different components in, in government bodies and groups and, and things like that that we had to go through to make sure that this met everybody's needs and it was a really successful project at the end. Getting into your site, um, so this is your site over at 117 Main Street. Um, I was a little disappointed because the site is pretty much pad ready and there's not a lot for <laughs> you to talk about. Uh, there's no wetlands, there's no floodplain. Um, we did a little ledge. <laughs> there is a little bit of ledge out there. Um, and then we know there's a bunch of utilities available in Main Street. Main Street's a local road, it's not Mass DOT jurisdiction, so we don't have to worry about um, getting any access permits. Um, and then we're aware that there was some septic upgrades that happened um, as previous station and that the, the hope is that that'll be able to be used for the new one. Definitely very early on, Matt's going to talk about we do some test fits on the site, but um, the other thing we'll be looking at very early on is um, getting preliminary boring information because we know that that rock is going to be an issue and we want to make sure we address that right at the beginning. Um, yeah, so, so like Kevin said, you know, we know ledge is an issue, so we know that that's something that on day one is going to be part of our investigation in, in how we understand the site. But also, you know, we don't, we, there's a lot of different ways to, that we can organize the, this site because you have the existing building now. We need to understand exactly how we're going to phase this to not disrupt your operations, how you can continue to operate on here while construction goes on, or if we have the opportunity to move you off site, great, that makes everything easier, but if not, you know, there's ways that we can work around it. There's a lot of room on site to sort of phase construction, move things around, but it's it's really gonna come out of, you know, what your needs are, when you need them, and, and, and how we're gonna organize that, that's, that's gonna come, come out of that. But making sure that we're paying attention to that site and those constraints early on is gonna be critical. And we do a lot of uh, early test fits, testing ideas. We like to put ideas on paper, test them out, and see what works and what doesn't. That's huge. It, we can generate them fast. It's a good way to test out what's possible. So uh, relevant experience, everybody talks about relevant experience. I mean, we've already showed you a lot of our experience. What I want you to know about our experience is I don't use it as a, a, as a, as a bludgeon to tell you how you must do things. Um, I use our experience to tell you what other people have done, what other solutions are there, and to help us find the solution that's right for you. Um, so it's not just a list, it's really a tool for us to use working together. Um, existing relationships, um, I, I rely a lot on the existing relationships of our team. It makes us work together better, it makes our coordination better, it means that there's less change orders as a result of coordination issues. Um, and it really gives us the opportunity to capitalize on the skills and talents of everyone 
and I, the on time, on budget, everybody in the world says that. I don't care as much about on time and on budget as I care about delivering the right that delivers value to your community on the schedule that you need. That's more important than saying fancy words or catch words like on time, on budget. So there we go. At that point, I just love to answer questions. Hard ones if you got. <laughs> I said that at the end of the stage line conference. It actually said on the screen, ask questions now. They tried. Did you get any? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, my first question, uh, I'd like you to kind of walk us through a little bit uh, of the construction bid process, your role, as well as uh, what you foresee the town's role. Matt, I think that's you. Sure. Happy to answer. So, um, it. it Certainly, there's there's a little bit of variance whether or not we were to do this seam at risk. So if we went Chapter 149A, fine. Uh, we just did the Shrewsbury with their police station, so we're very familiar with the process. But as far as it, it is our bid coordination, so we'll we'll assemble our documents, get everything ready to go. Um, uh, we're sort of right on that threshold, depending on how this project goes forward, where we may or may not be into that $10 million pre-qualification threshold. Um, if we need to. That's fine. Um, probably halfway through construction documents, maybe a little bit earlier on, that's when we would start going through the pre-qualification process, and we'd be w working with your OPM um, closely on that to, to, to manage that process, whether it's it's all on us, or all on them, or, or a shared responsibility throughout. Um, that's not a problem. Um, then, as, as far as bidding it goes, uh, whether or not we we go through um, a, a digital procurement or something like that or if we're going to do all paper bids you know, um, we can help manage that process we can we can help with the posting to combines and, and the advertisement but from there we'll t um, any of the RFIs that, that come in from any of the, the contractors whether it's the GCs or the, or the, the filed sub trades or filed sub bids if we're doing 149 uh, we'll take all those RFIs we'll um, share that with anybody that, that needs to be involved and provide a response we'll craft those responses and then issue them out to the bidders uh, via addenda um, we typically if you're if you're if we're doing a pre-qualification process we like six to ten weeks of pre-qual before we issue the bidding packages um, and then we, we typically like to see for a project this size three weeks for the filed sub bids two to three weeks for the general um, contractors as well um, we typically will participate in the bid openings whether it's just us opening and reading them if you have a procurement officer we'll coordinate with them um, and then we can help prepare and, and issue the bid tabs and issue those via addenda as well. What about um, you know the Division Zero, Division One specifications? Yep. Um, is Division Zero something you would look to us to provide? Uh, we would look for your input, but we would be happy to craft it. Uh, we would that the contract would we can either we can either start with a base AIA contract for the contractors. And your town council review our edits to that, or we can take your contract and incorporate it into the documents. Either way, other than that, we we typically prepare the invitation for bid and, and, and all that division zero work. Do you want to mention your qualifications, procurement officer? Oh, Kevin Kevin McGarry and I are are both MCPPO certified as well. Oh, okay. And I've been around long enough that I that I had to do the Massachusetts. <laughs> public bidding before we had OPMs to help us in the process. <laughs> so, um, I, I always feel like I, all the burden falls on us, so whenever we have help, it just lightens the load and makes it easier. Um, but, 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 but what, just one, just in addition to, the, to Kevin being MCPO certified, because he is your civil engineer, that will help you with procurement if we are going to do some signalization and need to bid that package out separately. And we do have experience. We did that in both Lexington and Maynard. Sorry. From a traffic. I forgot what I was going to say. It was really important. <laughs> <laughs> you can judge it if it comes back. Um, maybe walk me through uh, if you can describe something on a past project or condition that occurred on a past project that resulted in an unexpected cost um, and how you uh, mitigated it the best you could. So, we that occur, uh, it, it happens. Um, you know, you try to do as much research up front as you possibly can, but, you know, research costs money. Um, so I'm going to go to you, Matt, again. Let's talk about uh, Lexington with the, um, the asbestos on the, uh, the foundations. Sure. Yeah. So um, 
Lexington Fire. Uh, the, the headquarters was a late 50s building, I believe. Um, and it was, um, part of it was, was a crawl space and, and part of it was, it was a basement. Um, we, we prepared the, the hazmat specs, the abatement specs for it and everything. And, you know, um, during building demolition, there was some uh, asbestos and things like that in the ground that we couldn't account for. So we had to deal with it. Um, additionally, uh, there were some things that we knew that we had to deal with on site. So, so for, for example, um, it, it's all about mitigating risk and, and understanding what that risk is early on. Um, so we knew that the site has a high water table. We knew that the adjacent property was a um, gas station that had a fuel release 30 or something years ago. So we knew that there was petroleum impacted soils in the water table. We knew there was lead in the soils as well. Um, so what we did to mitigate much risk as we could because we couldn't deal with all of that hazardous material under the building is that we, we just said we're, we're not going to do regular spread footings. We're going to go with ran aggregate piers. The soil is a mess. We can't afford to take everything off site and replace it with the good stuff. So we're going to ram the aggregate piers. We're going to work with our hazardous uh, materials folks. We're going to work with our geotech and come up with a, with a plan to, to deal with that and sort of cap everything under the building. So we did that. But at the same time, once we tore the building down, there was some additional asbestos that needed to be dealt with. I don't know if you want to add anything I just, to that. I want to clarify that the asbestos was buried in the soil and not visible to us. So we did not know it was there. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure that clear. point is but, very clear. But so what happens when, 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 when you see this, right? It shuts the job down, everything becomes a mess. And every day the job shut down, extended general conditions, right? So now you're paying for money that you're not getting any value for because the job shut down and your schedule is delayed. And when your fire department is moved halfway down the street to a temporary building, conditions are less than ideal to begin with and you want them to be in a place where they can best serve the public. So we need to get them back into, the, into their new building as quickly as possible. I would just add to that, I mean, for this site in particular, but rock, is a big thing so we're that's something we want to investigate early and often so that we don't come across that during construction and it may not be as simple as just doing borings and, and there's been a few sites that we've dealt with where we knew there was rock and we really wanted to understand right. where exactly like let's map the surface of the rock are we putting our elevator in in, in a really problematic lotion um, we can do some easy test bits we go with your local dpw and we can really get a better sense of not only the soil but a lot information that would, would help us down the road but to we've dealt, mitigate the yeah, We've dealt with very complicated geotechnical conditions on projects as well as some of the environmental concerns. Again, Lexington had it all. But, but they, I think Matt had a close yeah. statement. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so but so sometimes this, this happens and, and you have to deal with it, right? And, and, and what's a contractor going to do as soon as he sees this? He's going to give you this huge number and nobody's going to want, you know, you're going to look at this and say, I, we can't, the project can't afford this. We didn't have this in the budget. Contingency is set at X, and now we have hundreds of thousands of dollars of unforeseen conditions. So from the very beginning of construction, you need to start building that relationship with your contractor to make sure that we're all playing on the same team. You know, A lot of architects, when they come in, the first project meeting that they have with their contractor, they're going to they're gonna sit there and say, these are the things you have to do to meet the project requirements and, and whatnot. We're going to come in, in the first day, we're going to say, what can we do to work together to best deliver this building? You know, it's turning around some middles quickly. It's it, it, it just it's building that relationship, that rapport, that trust, and that partnership. And so we did that here at Lexington. And when this change order came across our table because of all these unforeseen conditions, we were able to take this, I think it was like $300,000 to start with, and negotiate it down to a third of that value and, and use that leverage to then increase the, pro the project schedule and accelerate the schedule in ways to, to move it forward and it, and we can do that by helping them with RFI submittals change orders things like that that come across our desk if we get them back to them and turn it around as quick as possible and build that trust with the contractor and help them build float then they'll be more willing to work with us when these issues do come up of course it didn't hurt that we had a good contingency and came a million dollars under budget with a big day so uh, the, uh, the town of Lexington walked away with money in their cash, at their cash in their pocket at the end of the, the day on that project. Um, 
So you, you kind of already answered that question a little bit, but maybe you can give a different example um, of how you've resolved conflicts with contractors and maybe give an example. I, I, I know you kind of touched on it already a little bit, but maybe you can expand on it. So the, the contract that, you know, I always tell my people, you're not, you're not doing drawings. You don't think about it as designing a building. Don't think about it as playing architect. You're writing a contract. Just like a lawyer writes a contract, what we're, what we're doing is writing contracts. When we write the specs, these are terms of a contract. When we put lines on the drawing, you're writing a contract. And the contract is a powerful tool. At the same time, we're also working with relationships. And you know, you, you could be working with an architectural firm for a year and a half, two years on a project like this. Um, we could be working together with, with a contractor for over a year on a project like this. And so whenever possible, as Matt said, we want to build the relationship with the contractor um, and, and build a working relationship where we're aiming towards the same goal. Now, having said that, um, I think Jason over at, uh, from Castagna over at, uh, at Natick, you know, he said, Jeff, you're tough, but you're fair. And that's kind of like where I want to be. I, I, you know, I want to know, I want people to know that you're going to call out the contract, what's in there. We're going to enforce it, but we're going to be fair about it. And that fairness helps strengthen that relationship. When push comes to shove, the power of the contract is still there. And, and that's, you know, that you, you've got to lean on that and utilize that. Um, at the same time, to, to any extent that we can work out a win-win situation, that's a better solution for everybody. And so you're always looking for the win-win, but you know, you've got the power of, the, of that contract if you've written it well at your back. Did uh, anyone else have anyone, anything on that one? I think the only thing I would add is actually something you and I talked about earlier today was um, looking for the creative solution. Sometimes those problems come across um, our desks and it's, oh, something went wrong, here's what the cost is gonna be, and they haven't thought about it sideways, and they just throw the number at you, and this is what it's gonna take to fix it. Um, and it's really our responsibility to look at that sideways. Is there another solution that we're not thinking of? Is there something that we can partner with our engineers and say, is there a creative solution here that, that is a no cost, that would solve the problem but wouldn't burden us with, with added? Yeah, I think you know some RFIs come in during construction. It's, okay, I know how to answer that. Send it back real fast. But when that RFI comes in with that really loaded question, the, uh, the design team getting on a call or getting a meeting or getting to the site, the contractor, okay, here's the issue. What does everybody think the right solution is? Let's everybody just speak candidly about what the possibilities are. We were just doing this this morning in Natick. Um, that's how you get to the best solution, and that helps, helps strengthen that relationship with the contractor. Thank you. The easy questions are over now. <laughs> <laughs> what? Those are the easy ones? <laughs> Question okay. number four, part A. <laughs> <laughs> Explain your firm's approach to fire station systems like station alerting, radio communications, public address, security, etc. Who designs these systems and who procures them in your view? In your proposed approach, who is responsible for overall coordination? So, do you want to do that or you want me to do that? You're going to do it? No, you can do it. Oh, okay. I do. Um, we specify these systems. Yeah. Um, we work between uh, Pachiga Ross, our consultant on uh, Firematics, who's got loads and loads of experience on this, and with CES, um, our engineers, we work together um, to, to build the programmatic requirements of these systems, and then to develop the specifications of these systems so they are included. Um, a long, long, long time ago in my career, when I was a little puppy architect, um, you know, I learned about the dangers of, try of telling a municipal client that the project's going to cost X. And then later on telling him, well, we, X doesn't include Y and Z and W. So I go out of my way to try to be inclusive in our budgets. And we, when we start early, as we, I think uh, I, we, Rebecca, I think, talked about this earlier, when we start with our early budgets, there's already lots of line items because we don't want to leave things by the wayside. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk a lot to you about your needs. Um, and it's important to keep touch on those because in a year and a half, two year project, Sometimes your expectations change um, as you as you you know as you're in the process. You start to look sideways and see what other people are doing, and you may learn something. We want to make sure that information gets in there. But but we include it in our our documents. Bid as part of the project normally, um, 
and um, and then uh, and then it gets you know that we manage the, the CA. Now the most important thing about this is to be a little bit nuts about it. Um, and I have stood in front of many a coordination meeting, the dumb architect who's not an engineer, preferably in front of a whiteboard because it makes me happy. <laughs> and I've gone point to point. Okay, we have an antenna here, and we have a console here. How am I getting these wires from here to there? And what are the steps? What are the equipment in between? Because if I can diagram it, and I'm not an engineer, if I can diagram it, then my engineer can specify it, my contractor can build it, we can show it on the drawings and we can get it right. So I, you know, I sort of force them to make me understand. And if I, if, if, if through that process of dialogue and interaction with the vendors, I understand, then we can document it and show it and make sure that it gets installed correctly. I think the, the other thing I would just add to that, that initial coordination process is to ensure that all the right players are in the room. Oh, yeah. So any of your facilities folks or anyone who is handling your town-wide security um, or anything like that, that they're involved in those conversations. They know the ins and outs and they understand kind of some of the big picture planning. Having th those players in those meetings is critical to ensure that the end result is exactly what they're looking for. Um, I think that's been important in the past um, to make sure that their 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 insight um, is heard um, and really leveraging all of the experience that they bring to the And that table. includes any vendors that you work with? Yes, any vendors. So you're doing the coordination even if it's a state bid list purchased Absolutely. radio or something like that? You know, yeah. what gets you into trouble is, is the spaces between the contracts. And I don't like falling into the spaces between the contract. And like I said, if, if I can draw it, if I can, if, if through the dialogue with all the vendors, with the engineers, with everybody present, if I can draw the lines from point A to point B to point C to point D, then we all know where it is. Now it's only a, a matter of putting that information on the documents. And it might be as clear as, okay, this is where this contract stops and this is where this contract would start, but at least we're dealing with the big picture before we start to parse up so we're not missing any critical steps. And believe me, this used to be a lot harder. Um, there, there's more capacity to integrate systems today than there was when I started doing public safety buildings. So I draw a few less lines now. Um, next question. Uh, we, we, you know, the town expects full design services. Are there any scopes of work that you typically will exclude um, from your kind of scope? And if so, what are they and why? Uh, that we would exclude? Yeah, I, I don't want to do hazmat because my insurance carrier won't let me. No, and we've got, we've got hazmat That's the one we've heard, we've heard that one more than once. And that's on the team, um, and um, we've dealt with the insurance issue and we frequently include it, I, it's not an issue. Um, you know, it, some of the specialty consultants that we are glad to include, but don't normally immediately add to a team, like there's lighting consultants, and, you know, if this was a library, I might add them to a lot of libraries, but I might want to include them. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not talking about in-scope versus um, You know, acoustic consultants, like, those yeah. kinds of things, they're always available, and, and if there's a particular issue, that we can certainly bring them on board, but, um, you know, we want to be clear that we understand at the beginning and that you understand at the beginning which one are providing and which ones you're providing. I don't have a problem getting a surveyor. I don't have a problem getting a geotech engineer. I don't have a problem. Uh, give me some help. <laughs> wetlands. 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 <laughs> yeah. I don't have a problem getting all those people on board. Um, you know, we've got to structure our agreements, right? I, 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 you know, I've been around. I've seen horror stories when the, the agreements between prime and consultant aren't done well. So we make sure that we get that right so that you know that the protection is there. We want you to own it all. <laughs> <laughs> and we would be happy to give it all. Okay. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I, I know of a school project that I did not work on, but a good friend of mine did, um, where the, the property description said that the, the property line follows the old dirt road. Um, what they didn't know is the old oak tree fell and the old dirt road got relocated to go around where the old oak tree fell. And then after the building was partway built, the neighbors said, wait a minute. <laughs> and so, you know, all of a sudden there's, there's people trying to make claims and, and you know, and you, you, know, you, want, you want the surveyor whose job it is to own that, you want his insurance to carry that. So making sure that that pathway is clear, even when it's going through us, um, is important. Thank you. I think you've already touched on this in part by your uh, example of the antenna to the console. Um, but 
help me understand how your firm and your subconsultants, what process you use to make sure that all the things need, are on all the drawings so that you don't come later and say, hey, we've got this, this stack of chain drawers for things we just forgot to put on, or someone forgot. So I hate that. Process. <laughs> <laughs> the process is huge with me, and, and you know, not, not, I have done projects with, with very few change orders, and so when we talk as a team, we talk about how do we make sure the process is as good as it can be. And I think Matt, I'm, you're coming to you again, man, <laughs> um, just, just did a great job on this with the Shrewsbury project. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, like I, I think I mentioned before, you know, we spent a lot of time working through our, our process with our consultants. And um, since the pandemic open, opened up some new ways for us to communicate, you know, we're, we're, con we're back in the office, but we're continuing to use these tools. So we used to have, you know, five, 10 years ago, we would have our consultant meetings, you know, once every three weeks, once a month, once every couple of months. And you're just shuffling documents back together, back and forth, and you're hoping everybody picks everything up and then you miss scope. Uh, now, because of Zoom and everything like that, we, we actually have standing meetings for every one of our projects with our entire consultant team every single week. When we meet with all of you folks, rather than it just be the architect or the architect and, and, and the project manager or, or the two people from our office, we're going to open up a Zoom link and we're going to have our entire project team on all those meetings too. They, like, it's open to them so that they can participate because the more first-hand information everybody gets, the better coordinated they're going to Because it's not me going back and saying, well, Chief said that. They're going to hear us and then the telephone happens and then all of a sudden your six apparatus bays become, you know, a parking garage or something. And it just, everything starts, starts to fall apart. It's, that, <laughs> that was extreme. it's an extreme example, but it's that, <laughs> it's that chain of communication that, that causes breakdown in some of that scope. <clears throat> and so making sure that everyone's getting that information firsthand is, is, is one of the easiest ways for us to make sure that that all goes together. The peer reviews, the periodic peer reviews that we do, a lot of firms will do a peer review at the end of, of, of the documents, and it might be somebody on the project team looking at it. It's somebody, it's a partner in the firm outside of our team doing it at every phase of the project. And this isn't flipping through the architectural drawings to make sure that we've got all of our wall partitions tagged. It's going through all of our consultants' drawings, page by page, that on the Shrewsbury Police Station that we had just bid, it took them three weeks to go through the entire peer review because it's that in-depth and detailed. And that goes through, he does, it, we do all that live in Bluebeam Review through Bluebeam Studio. So all of our consultants are seeing the comments as they come live, as he's marking it up. So he'll see something and say, this looks like it might be an issue. Our consultants will see that as he's typing it and be able to respond, address it live in real time the entire time that we're doing it. That's half the change orders. Half of them are gonna be er errors and omissions, and that's how we mitigate a lot of those. The other half is owner ads. Things that you guys, <laughs> I understand. you know, things that you didn't, no. and that's not, <laughs> and that's not to be, that's not differentiated no. from errors and omissions because those <laughs> should be considered partially an omission of the architect because half of the time it's because we didn't communicate exactly what that was gonna be. And you're changing it after construction because it wasn't right to begin with. Or you or you didn't understand that, you know, we need this many outlets to power this many pieces of the equipment that you're putting in there. So that's where Rebecca's process that she was talking about, about that, that clear visualization and that constant dialogue comes into play. By us being more of a partner throughout the entire process as we develop these documents together, you'll have a better understanding of what we're trying to do and you can say while we're drawing it, no, 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 that's not gonna work. We need to fix it because you're gonna look at it in 3D you know, we're gonna bring a lot of different visual visualization options to the table that'll help you better understand what we're documenting. Because at the end of the day, you're buying that package. And if you don't understand what you're buying, you're gonna have buyer's remorse. And, and I think we also have a, because we work together consistently as a team, we are constantly talking about lessons learned and we have all of the lessons from a previous project and we have all the change orders from a pre previous project. So we know that we're not gonna repeat those same mistakes. So anything that we've seen as a team over the past five projects, we're constantly discussing and ensuring that it, that doesn't happen again. Um, if it was just a coordination miss, I mean, it can be something as little as, well, a civil engineer thought we were owning it or a structural engineer was gonna own it and the structural engineer thought the civil engineer was gonna own it and then no one ended up owning it. Or it was just in the drawings but not fully coordinated into the specs. All of those lessons that we've come across, we ensure that we're, we're touching base on them, we're ensuring that they're incorporated into the next step so they're not repeated.
Do you have to change orders? Or? Well, whatever, you know, <laughs> throwing out numbers. Um, <clears throat> a major concern for the fire department staff is their living quarters. Um, obviously, you all have walked the site and you, you saw the current conditions. Uh, obviously, we've outgrown uh, those facilities. It's an overburdened situation. Um, what are approach to tackling the temporary quarters, uh, relocating operations, and how would you make this matter a priority? Um, and how do you provide a cost-benefit analysis of the different options? Wow, there's a lot loaded into that question. There's living quarters, there's temporary quarters, there's the cost-benefit analysis. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go backwards, and you're, you're gonna work on the living quarter while okay. I answer <laughs> these first two. Uh, the, the best way to evaluate the options, um, we, we just did this on two projects, um, one for the Munson Fire Station and one for uh, North Smithfield, Rhode Island Police, where um, what we did is they wanted to know, should we, should we add on and renovate? Should we build new? And so the best way to find the answer to that is to really test the heck out of both of them. It became our job to make the most successful plan that is an ad reno plan and the most successful plan of a new construction on this, you know, in respect to the site that they had. Um, and then um, look at all the costs and not only just the direct construction costs, but all of the associated costs. Temporary quarters is a big piece of that. Can, can you operate out of the facility? Do you need to have a, a swing space? Do you need temporary apparatus bays, which is a gift that keeps on giving because tents are hard to heat. Um, <laughs> you've got to look at all of that and then you've got to look at, at the life cycle cost as well. So, uh, you know, for instance, in uh, North Smithfield, Rhode Island, the delta between new construction on the same site and renovation of the building was really pretty close. But when you look at the life cycle cost, the new construction was so much more efficient that over 20 years, why would you spend money on the old building? Because there's too many cons in the layout, there's too many you know, compromises getting around the challenges of that, and in the long run, it doesn't even pay off. Um, Munson, it was closer. Uh, it was closer, uh, the difference between new construction and, and, and renovation. Um, but still, you know, you're putting forward the criteria to help make that decision. So now, temporary so living quarters. Ironically, we talked about your temporary living quarters, and it could potentially provide an opportunity for temporary facilities if we're renovating and creating an addition because you have a, a mobile capacity of those living quarters. So we could leverage that potentially during construction. Um, I think from a living quarter standpoint, it's something that we would talk up front about from a, you know during programming. Um, to understand exactly what your needs would be around those living quarters. Um, what we've consistently seen is individual bunk rooms um, for a few different reasons, ensuring that you're getting proper sleep. Um, we're gonna be talking about acoustics, we're gonna be talking about where they're positioned on site, lighting. Um, we're gonna talk about how the alerting work, uh, works. Um, do you want everybody to wake up? Do you want all the lights to come on? Do you want uh, all of that? Um, really plays a big part into ensuring that you're able to operate effectively 24 hours um, a day. So um, we'll kind of document all of that as a part of the programming process um, and then um, ensure that they're designed accordingly. I mean, I, I think from you know temporary living quarters right now, the fact that you have to go between the buildings is not ideal. Um, you're responding from those quarters. I mean, I myself, I actually had a fire at my house at two in the morning and I was astonished how quickly they got there. It was probably the most terrifying night of my life and I had never appreciated more of what you do in that moment. Um, but they were rolling right out of bed and getting to getting to my house and um, I think just an appreciation to um, allow that to happen effectively um, that you're not having to run between buildings or running from your living quarters to go find an apparatus in a, a remote um, uh, garage of some sort um, so from a living standpoint I think just ensuring that it's incorporated properly into the building design. and I don't want, I don't want to just think about the dormitories themselves but also the day room the kitchen um, the fitness facilities all of those space are part of the living facilities for an active fire department and you know making sure that we have the appropriate facilities the space the ability to you know to to to, to learn uh, to commune um, to be healthy um, making sure that we respect the separation of the hot and cold zones and protect your health those are all important things 
Please describe your firm's approach to construction administration. What are your practices when it comes to keeping projects running smoothly, verifying adherence to the construction documents, responding to RFIs, and then uh, supervision and inspections? Yeah, so... Um, I didn't say it was you, yeah. He's jumping. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think we touched on a, a few of these things a little bit, um, but um, a lot of it for us is about building partnerships with the contractor so that we're all working towards the same goal, but at the same time knowing when we need to drop the hammer and be forceful and strict and enforce the contract. Um, as far as uh, RFIs, submittals, things like that, we, we sort of have a commitment that if we can if we can reasonably turn anything around within a 48-hour window, we try to. The faster we get that material back to the contractor, the quicker he can just keep moving forward, especially now when we're dealing with a limited supply chain. Um, lead times on a lot of things are, are really challenging and it causes it can cause a lot of issues with the contractor schedule. So we want to make sure that we are not contributing to any delays in the schedule. So we want to keep them moving forward. Um, having said that, we also need to be diligent in our review and make sure that we're doing detailed analysis of everything that's coming across our desk, right? We, the last thing we want is for a submittal or a shop drawing to go out that has incorrect information and now it's getting built incorrectly in the field. And our documents say, you know, you own the contract documents and even if the shop drawings were approved and have wrong information on it, you built it wrong, you have to tear it out and do it again. That's just a whole mess of arguments and butting heads and that just leads to animosity and, and that's the last thing you want on a job site because there's enough of that to begin with. Um, in terms of on-site inspections, um, we're there all the time. We have a pretty open relationship with our contractors in, in that I don't mean everything filters through the architect. Um, I don't mind the, the contractor talking to Kevin. Um, as long as all that information then gets back to me to make sure that, that, that we're managing that at the end of the day. But, but if, if the contractor has a question on, you know, we're going through in, in Shrewsbury at their police station right now, we're just laying out the building, these, their first foundation pours tomorrow. And so the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of coordination on setting joints throughout the site and making sure the survey data aligns with the, with the footings and foundations. And so myself, another administrator in my office, and Kevin have had plenty of conversations throughout that, and, 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 and that's great so that we can keep that open line of communication. Um, I'm on the job sites all the time. You know, I like to be there once a week. Um, I was there just before this. <laughs> if you can see the mud on my boots, um, I fell into a little mud pit, and that's okay. That's part of the part of the job description. But um, I like to be on site, and I like to bring our younger staff on site quite a bit as well. Um, CA is one massive opportunity for mentorship so I like to make sure that early on the contractor is willing to accept that and I like to bring younger staff that are training to be the next generation of architects in our office so that they're able to understand because they do a lot of the drawings they need to understand what they're drawing um, so I want to make sure that, that the whole construction process is a mentoring process at the same time. We also leverage technology to help administer the contract. So we have um, typically, I mean, we use Newforma, but we can utilize them. Um, we work with the contractor to ensure everything is digitally transferred, so that expedites all of that back and forth. Um, willing to share our models. And many times our consultants will share our Revit models more, and sub more subcontractors now are actually leveraging our, our built models, um, and that expedites some of their shop drawing development um, or other coordination documents. Um, so we do leverage every piece of technology, um, even pun even down to the punch listing when we're closing out the job. Um, we go out there with iPads and can create a live punch list that they can then back punch live, um, and we can comment and close live. So we try to leverage that to help expedite um, and keep the schedule moving forward. Yeah, for Lexington, we what, four of us went, five of us? Five of us, we did the first punch list in half a day. <laughs> and it was with them that afternoon. So it helps keep it really quick. Really Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Kevin mentioned the police station in his opening remarks, and you guys may have <clears throat> read or heard some of the stories about our new favorite building in town. It was late, it was over budget. Uh, it is. It will continue to be a uh, little voice on the shoulder for this entire project. Uh, we will be we will be answering to questions as we go through this process, and uh, you know I I get the. We have experience, we know our job, we'll, we'll keep people informed, I understand all of that. You guys got into a little bit of it in your presentation, but you know, this, 
this is a sticky wicket and I'm wondering if you guys have any experiences you can draw on or aces up your sleeve or clever solutions for this situation that, that we're in on this project here. Well, first off, um, when I read the things that I read, um, it, it hurts. It hurts because our profession shouldn't represent that way. And it hurts because I, I know the firm. I used to work with Brian. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm stunned when I, when I see the things that, that are documented in there. Um, but, you know, I also know how firms get into bad situations. Um, and, you know, a lot has to do whether they overcommit themselves, um, whether they have the right personnel staffing the job, uh, whether the right oversight and the message is there. And none of this, you know, this is all, you know, as I said, it, it hurts me when I, when I see things like this happen because it's not good for the profession. Um, uh, as far as experience going forward, um, what were you gonna say about Lexington? Um, just sort of a similar challenging conversation that's good to have. Sure that's exactly the right <laughs> um, look you know it, there's going to be a, a, a trust building uh, exercise with your community uh, there's a trust building exercise with you there's going to be a trust building exercise with everybody moving forward through this project that's the fact you can't change that uh, can't shy away from it either um, the only thing I can do is come in here and try to give you a reason why behind every decision that's made. And this, this, is, this is a long-standing um, practice with us is that I don't ever wanna go in front of a town meeting and have them challenge me with, well, why'd you do that? And the answer is, because I thought it looked good or because I liked it. No, everything that you do when you're spending public money has a reason and tapping into that reason and being able to present it and talk about it is important to building trust. I mean, if, if, if people can trust what you're saying about the decisions you made during the design process, um, if they trust that you're sharing openly all the information that you have and that you're diligently gathering information and that you're providing the committee with decision-ready information. In other words, I don't want to come to you and say, hey, what HVAC system do you want? What are you going to tell me right now? I don't know. <laughs> I want to come to you and, and tell you what your options are, tell you what the advantages are, what the disadvantages are, what the cost differences are, what the life cycle differences are, so that you can make decisions. And so that when somebody asks me at town meeting floor, or asks you at town meeting floor, why did you go with a uh, VAV system? I, well, we would have a reason why. And the reason why is because we evaluated all the options, we looked at all the fact, we looked at all the data. Here's, we can pull up the slide that we all looked at together and, and, and this is the reason we chose this system. And that should be true about every decision you make in this process. If it's not defensible, it's not good use of public money. You know, millionaires aren't funding these things. People are. People that work in grocery stores, people that, that that, that you know do construction people that have regular jobs and and so we need to be a, be ready to be open and honest about the decisions we make wow i didn't know i was going in that direction <laughs> I, I think the only thing i would add is a, a part of our process is to strategize with you about what challenges that y you know your community better than we do and you know what the concerns are going to be what headaches they've dealt with in the past what those pain points are going to be um, and we can help strategize of how do we get ahead of those. How do we um, answer that question before it's asked. How do we ensure we're providing information consistently? Um, there's many ways we can um, ensure that um, in a few towns that we've worked with, they want to put a website to, they want to make sure that all of the project information is there at any point. If the public has questions, they can look there. Um, and, and that allows them to ensure that that information is available um, so that if they, they have concerns, that's where you're going to go. Um, I've even worked with a few departments where um, the, the fire department was taking on a lot of those questions from the public and they kind of just created a frequently asked questions area and a lot of that had to do with pains of the past. It was, it was you know, things that went wrong on pro 
different jobs that the community has funded previously. Um, how are you going to ensure that doesn't happen again? Um, and we, we do really view that as a partnership with you um, to understand what those are and how can we get ahead of them. It ties into your um, public Great, thanks. Uh, we certainly want you to design us an award-winning building, but for me, it's important that it wins an awards for functionality as opposed to aesthetics. How are you going to take the Chief's program, make that a priority, and balance the aesthetics that the community desires with the functionality of the fire station? All right, I'm going to do the start. So you know what story I'm telling, right? Yeah. <laughs> so a long time ago, back when I was that puppy architect I talked about earlier, yeah, I'd been working with this uh, firm, and I'd done a lot of police stations at that point. I don't know, six, seven. <laughs> so many. And I thought, dang, I'm an expert. I know all sorts of good stuff about police station design. And I went to work for Westford, Massachusetts. You know the town? And uh, so we, we designed a police station for them. Um, that was a 20, 24,000 square foot police station with a four-lane indoor shooting range. And I was so proud we went to this public meeting and we put up the floor plans and I talked about how great the adjacencies worked and how, how great you know, the uh, evidentiary control was and how great the dispatch center was and how great you know, the, the <coughs> control functions related and how close they were together and what a great community training space they had. And nobody cared. <laughs> what they cared about was the elevations of the building. They said, Why'd you put brick on it? Well, brick is intrinsically ballistic resistance. It's got longevity, it's durability, it's low maintenance and, and secure. It's the first best choice for a police station. We don't have any brick in Westford. <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing downtown Westford. It's all clapboard. This is our identity. And oh yeah, yeah the granite quarry is right over there. Um, I got all caught up in the functional aspects of it that I thought that was all that was important. But the identity of the building is just as important and not for me to decide what the identity of your civic building is because it's your civic building. And so being able to tap in to use resources, to your community's resources and understanding what their expectations are about a building is really, really important. From the functional standpoint, who's got this? So, yes, I would bring it almost back to you know basic architectural education that in a public safety building, form really doesn't drive function. Form is going to drive the form in, in, in this instance because response adjacencies are going to be critical. That we are going to position the building from a from a layout standpoint on the site um, that is most effective and efficient for the department's operations. Now, the aesthetic and the form, to Jeff's point, still ver very much matters. Um, so how can we then take that and translate that into a building that fits within that context? Um, that's something that we also constantly consider is, is where are we positioned within the town? We've had a few different stations where maybe they're on um, they're in a residential community. Well, apparatus bays are big. They're tall, they're big, that can be a big mass. How do we break that down so it really fits within that residential context? Um, how do we create space that's um, welcoming? You know, it's a, it's a public building. How do we ensure that the public feels welcome? I know where the front end, front door is. If I have a problem or maybe there's an emergency medical, I know where to go. I'm going to walk into that station and know and be very comfortable and know that I'm going to be met with someone um, in a safe environment. So I, I think there's a lot of different ways we can balance aesthetics and function. Um, I think with the, with the programming to start, we can really begin to lay out those adjacencies and, and ensure that the operations are effective, um, and then massage that into a, a form and an aesthetic that fits within the community. You know who our worst critics are? Each other, yeah. I, I, I'm a principal <laughs> in the firm. I could have had a little office with a door and all that, and I sit at Rebecca's back, you know, Matt's right there, and the reason is because we invite and welcome the, the, the dialogue, the criticism. You know, hey, look, when we were in the programming. We, they said this was an important adjacency, and the plan you're drawing doesn't have it. And you're right. You're right. Got to go back and rethink that. And, and we love awards; those are great. But that's not why we do public safety work. Um, if we if we wanted to just you know do do the magazine covers and, and all the all the, the great aesthetic pieces of architecture, we we would do something else. We 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 do public safety work specifically because it's 
it's our way of giving back to the community and giving back to the people that, that really protect us. And so that's, that's really the reason, that's really our why. Um, we all sort of have public safety ties. Jeff was the architect for my great grandfather's fire station. So, you know, we have a long history. That's um, how old I am. <laughs> that was, it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but, but we check our egos at the door and, and this is an ego driven architecture. This is, this is our way of doing sort of public service using our expertise. Thank you. We conducted post occupancy interviews of any of your public safety or fire station uh, buildings and I guess if, if so, what are some of the lessons learned that you've taken away from those? Um, we, we don't have an actual formal post occupancy evaluation process. We've talked about it a lot. However, I got to tell you, you spend a couple years with folks and you build relationships. Um, you know, when when Polly. Sutton police uh, at their uh, uh, ribbon cutting ceremony, you know, uh, Chief Toll said that uh, you know not only not only did I find a great architect, I found a great friend. He's talking about me. Um, he found a great friend, and so we we constantly have dialogue with uh, in follow up with our with our clients. We talk about what works, what doesn't work. I just got an email from Michael Cronin. Um, from Lexington today with uh, some things that he's noticed that, that maybe we want to look at in the future as a, as a change in practice. Um, you know, one of the early stations I did was up in Hudson, uh, uh, New Hampshire. And, you know, I had a 15, 20 year relationship with the chief there. Um, and we got, we got to talk a lot about what works and doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, probably we should formalize a post occupancy, but the, the relationship seemed to go on, and we keep talking about it and learning learning that way. So, it's usually it's usually little lessons learned. You know, it's it's something small. Um, that was just oh, you know, uh, we were dealing with one recently where they can't quite hear the paging clearly in the restrooms when they're in a shower. Okay, well then maybe we should look at where we locate those speakers. So it's usually minor things. Um, or it's a, a building monitoring system. I remember you get that phone call about the, well, the lights keep going off and they're, uh, yeah, it's like little, it's little things where it's maybe just not understanding the system. There was North Brookfield police where I got a phone call from <laughs> Tick to Mage and the chief and he says, uh, he says, the, the lights aren't working in the training room. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, during the daytime, we noticed that uh, all, the, all the lights along one side of the room go off. And I said, Tick, um, it's a, daylight harvesting system it's a sustainable uh, strategy so when you have enough there's daylight sensors when there's enough light in the room the electric lights along the edge turn off because you don't need them so usually they're smaller items um, but creating that to just by creating that dialogue um, I do have an evidence-based design certification background um, so we do talk about post occupancy more on the healthcare side from a firm so our firm does a lot of other different types of um, work in different sectors um, so we are very familiar with post-occupancy. Um, to just point, we haven't necessarily done them for public safety specifically, um, but they're definitely something that can be leveraged um, from a lessons learned standpoint. Um, and we'd be willing to do if that was something the community was really interested in understanding. One of the other ones I learned a long time ago, is, sorry, it's not a fire one. It, I, it, uh, Chief Gendron in Hudson, New Hampshire called me up and I said, he said, I think there's something wrong with the, uh, the, the natural voice transmission ballistic window. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, the people in the records room, um, when they're talking to people in the lobby, um, they can hear them just fine. But when the people in the lobby talk, the people in the records room can't hear them. Huh. He said, Chief, do you have any sound in the lobby? He says, no, it's quiet out there. He said, do you have office equipment in the records room? Well, of course, yeah. Ah, I see the problem. Because it was so quiet in the lobby. You know how people, if it's really quiet, they tend to speak quietly. They weren't being heard over the office equipment on the records side of the window. So the people on the records side of the window, because they, you know, they hear that background noise, they raise their voices so they can be heard. From that day forward, we incorporated a uh, intercom system um, into all of our transaction windows. So that if there's somebody on the public side and they, they talk quietly, person on the other side can turn the volume up and make sure that they can have clear communication. Um, you know, lesson after lesson, but you know, following up with that. Thank you. Okay, last questions. Uh, you've introduced your team to us. Please confirm who's going to take the lead, and are we going to see this team through design, construction, right to closeout? 
So my team right now um, is composed of folks you see here, um, Mr. Mr. Didi and Mr. Barshevsky, um, Mr. Hills, um, uh, Mr. Melangonis, uh, I cannot say Antonia's last name properly to save my life. Super Italian. <laughs> Uh, and, and Renee Perry. Um, this is my team. Yeah, I may add to that team um, in terms of resources um, if workload justifies it. However, this is the core team. This is the team that follows all the way through. Um, Rebecca and I were both at, at Natick today as we're closing out. Um, <coughs> Matt and I were at uh, Shrewsbury. When we were <laughs> yeah, you were there too. <laughs> Matt and I were at the groundbreaking in Shrewsbury. Um, this is this is the team, um, and we like to rely on the the talents and strengths of everybody on this team. I think in just answering the questions, you've learned that everybody's got different skill sets here. And I want to make sure that we're applying the right skill sets to the right part of the project as well. Um, and so, and, it, and that even when it's the different, you know, if it, we're in say, and you might have noticed Matt's pretty strong in that. Um, but then that Rebecca is still free to, to interject and provide ideas and comments. And, and when we're doing design, you know, everybody's got a voice in that. But yes, this is the team. Uh, I, I'm not a marketing person. I do public safety buildings. And typically you'll see more than one of us. Um, we feel very strongly about ensuring that there's um, multiple sets of ears in the room um, that allows someone yeah. to be taking notes, someone to really be engaging and listening. Um, what we found is it's very difficult for me to be diligently writing down what you're saying, but also actively listening to you um, and, and what the real needs are. So we are, we're, you'll constantly see pairs of us um, in one shape or if not in person, you'll see the other one in squares. <laughs> <laughs> And a follow that is how quickly are you ready to do this project? Do we have a contract to sign? Yeah, no, yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, there, you know, there's, there's the, you know, we've got to sort out the agreement and all. But usually, that's not that can do that can happen very quickly. We get in a room, we can probably do it in a day. But um, um, we're ready to roll. We have resources available um, to start. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much. Is that it? Where's the Sorry. hard one? Thank you. <laughs> Those were good questions. <laughs> they were. No, thank you. They were good questions. Um, I like it when we have to stop and think a little bit. That's it's kind of cool. <laughs> Rebecca, can you forward us a copy of your presentation in PDF? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. You could just put it down. <laughs> <laughs> or you could do a mic drop. As yeah, right. Just do a mic drop. That's pretty epic. <laughs> <something. laughs> It only, only hurt the people. Opportunity. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Do we have any more tonight? You must all be out to it. Well, normally we go around you know, and do the handshake and do the COVID situation and see yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good? Yes. All, right. all good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Safe travels. Thank you. Curious to know if, it, if people want to discuss any of the firms first, or if we should just um, rank them one through five, and maybe try and narrow it down first, and then kind of talk about them a little bit. Maybe a, a smaller group of them, if there's a couple that we can kind of know that is not in anybody's top two or so, two or three. What does everybody think, or do you want to just discuss thoughts on all of them right away? I think I have my one through five. I don't know how this process really works, but if our might be worth one and two are similar, then that might eliminate a substantial amount of discussion. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should go for that. That so was why don't I 
I've got a sheet, but we can save that for the sheets now. What are you doing? I was so my my thought was we do the sheets and try and get it down to maybe. I've got a I've got a spreadsheet ready to go to take all of your totals and put them in yeah. so I can tell you who the top two are. If yeah, that's, and if then it's maybe obvious. we can discuss those. Sure. I'm just get worried about this because I'm everyone kind of is substantially different from somebody else's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would be, you know, I mean, we can open it up that if someone feels that someone I think it's on the same page. I think it's inevitable because <laughs> we all have such different These things. I guess should we ask, right. um, were there any, anything that came out of any of the reference checks? Thank you. Or were they all, yeah, I think all positive. <laughs> <laughs> all the, we, we know how those usually go. I don't think there were any pores in there. I yeah. think there were good, a few a few fairs, a few goods, a lot of it's, it's, it's some excellence. I mean, it was a it's a mix. You know, I don't think anybody got fair across the board. You know, there may have been a, an issue here or there, um, but that's often job specific or sub consultant specific. Um, well, when you talk about fairs, were were any fairs? Did that those types of comments or lack of comments line up with any of the issues that we're trying to make sure we don't have problems again with on this project? So, so what well, one of these things? Like no attention to detail and <laughs> no, 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 nothing that, that easy. <laughs> Sorry, no. I'm just <laughs> but but it kind of goes off in the discussion that we had. You know, occasionally there's a sub consultant that you know there's a, an issue with, and what I would suggest is is that. If there's a concern about a sub consultant that's on the team or something that we give them the opportunity maybe to change that out if there was a concern um, you know and, and because it's you know that part of the team can be can be changed you know as I said to full disclosure to Bly as an example you know we proposed PM and C as our cost estimator PM&C was, I think, on three of the five firms cost estimating. So what I said is, as an example, you know, you're going to get four cost estimates from that firm. You're going to get one or two from us. I would rather, if I really like the firm, let them use them, and I'll come back to you with somebody different. So very similarly, if there's a concern with one of the sub-consultants through a, some feedback or whatever, um, you know, we could obviously go back and say, hey, you know, they liked you, your first choice, but... Before we talk about fee, would you be open to changing your, you know, your MEP engineer or something like that? Um, so, and if I could, just because you have some more experience working with some of these firms than, than us, one question I did have was a specific question for context: How involved is the, is Jeff Shaw in the Barry. project? All the time. All the time. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's none of those firms does the principal who was shown disappear, which is great because sometimes it does happen. Sometimes it does happen. Um, you know, maybe a bigger, you know, bigger project, school pro you know, someone might fade into the background and things get hand off, handed off. You know, not the case really with our experience with, with those firms, um, they all I could say, we, even Schwartz Silver, we've Vertex did the library with Compass before we acquired them. Did uh, Newton Walpole, um, same thing, you know, less ex less common experience, but you know, by, but all all five I think, you know, we know all the principals. They've got their cell phone numbers, you know. Um, couple of new faces from a project management standpoint, like on the Doran Whittier team. I never worked with that gentleman, but I knew the other three folks. Um, you know, a lot of this is word of mouth and, and job to job thing. And if it's a successful team, they kind of keep it keep it together. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to single them out, but in, in the discussion with them, I kind of felt he had, he took the lead in a lot of the conversation so I just wanted to know how involved he was. Yeah, he doesn't disappear. Yeah. And Southboro, as an example, I would tell you that in almost every single one of the meetings, Jeff and Ellen came to the meetings. So 
you do see, to, to what Rebecca just said, you do see a lot of tag teaming through the, through the, at least, you know, at least through the design phase. And then maybe when you get to construction, it's a little bit less as it gets a little more uh, structured and regular. But I've never had a problem getting in touch really with any of them. Not allowed to have a tie either. <laughs> Messes up the math. <laughs> okay. One, 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 four, five. Nah, it's not going to help us. I, I will say it's it's pretty tough. They were yeah. five really good firms. Are we yeah. going pass them down? Or? Yeah, sure. To, uh, so, out of curiosity, can you remind me what order we offered them the interviews in? So, we offered them the. Oh, that's a great question. Give me. One second. <laughs> the order we offered them the interviews, the, the ranking at the end of the of the hard copy scoring was HKT one, Tecton two, Doran Whittier three, Schwartz Silver four, Context five. Lost me there. Try one more time. <laughs> I got one. HKT was one. Yeah. Tecton was two. Doran Whittier was three. Schwartz Silver was four. Context was five. Thank you. Is this like the Olympics? Do you throw all the highest mark, lowest mark? Both <laughs> Driving by that Natick site every single day. I was wondering who designed that. Which site? The Natick. It's right off of Route 9? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right on the, right right on the corner there. By Speed Street. And yeah, yeah, I know. It's right next to the car wash. I like the Walpole Station. I went by there. Walpole Station. I normally end up in that part of the main myself. I'm on AT and Native are right on Speed Street. Really Numerous nice. people say good things about the South. But we're on, um, we have an armory across the water. Okay. Right on Speed Street. That was context. Which one? I can't keep them straight. Yeah, it's funny. Has, I, that's why I asked about uh, order, because I was convinced yes. that the one that was, the last one we let in was Doran so Whittier. Headquarters. It wasn't them, it was Context. Remember, we had that long conversation about whether we were going to do four or five. The context was five. I honestly thought that was yeah, that's that's more more the right that kind of helped. Yeah. How they answered it really kind of helped me differentiate yeah. between the different firms. Because they all kind of had different answers to it, and some were better than others, I felt like. Okay. So. We have a tie. No, no you don't have a tie. <laughs> you don't have a tie. <laughs> so, it's... So basically what I, paper, scissors. Yeah. what I did is, um, so this basically ends up like golf scoring, okay? So one through five. Um, 
the lowest, basically, then the highest ranked firm with five out of three, four, five, six, with five out of seven first place is Doran Whittier with an average of 1.43. The second place firm with one first and three seconds is Tekton at 2.43. And then right behind them with one first and one second and really, and then all the rest thirds was Context at 2.43. Five, seven. So that puts HKT and Schwartz Silver, um, you know, at 3.7 and 4. Point, almost 4.9. So HKT and Schwartz Silver are out, uh, or are, you know, I'd say below the line. Um, Doran Whittier is, you know, a, a, almost a full point ahead of um, Tecton. That doesn't mean you don't have to, don't have the conversation. Sure. But context is right behind Tecton. So that's I'm sorry. Can you read off those scores again? Yeah. Sure. Let me. So let me. I'll give you all the the, yeah, the average HKT. ranking. Doran Whittier, 1.43. Short Silver, 4.86. HKT, 3.71. Context, 2.57. Tecton, 2.43. I'm just going to double check one last time. Make sure. Send that to me tomorrow, right? Absolutely. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll give some, some input. Um, I probably didn't have Tecton rated as highly as others. I felt that, you know, answering some, you know, particularly your question, I didn't think that they had as good of an answer, I think, as some of the other firms. What I will say is, from my rating process of reading the RFQs to the interview process, Doran Whittier definitely rose the most for me. I was pretty impressed with the interview. Um, that being said, I don't think we could go wrong hiring any of the top three. Uh, this here, I guess, does anyone have a strong desire to go with someone other than Dorn Whittier? I ranked, I, I, I guess I'm the one that ranked Tecton 1 and, and Dorn and Whittier 2, but it was a hard choice. Yeah. And maybe it's just because I saw them last and it was most fresh in my mind, which is, you know, why they do that. Um, I get that. Um, I did like this answer about dealing with the public and what to do. Um, I would be comfortable with either one. I'm just glad they came out one and two. He was the, I had said something to Fly previously, he was the only person to actually come at it and say, address it. Like, like everyone else kind of took the approach of, to that question of, well, we're going to do all these things. It's like his approach was more acknowledge it, you know, own like it. go right in and own it. But you know, we learned that. So if we end oh, up anybody with Whittier, then we're saying this Absolutely. is how we want you to approach it. Because no, and that's and that's a very good point. You know, anything that you learned from the other four you interviewed that you Big really deal. liked that they don't do, you say, hey, we got an idea for you, <laughs> you know, and you could present that to them. You know, I, for, like, for sure. I like HKT's version. Just have a meeting first to make the public feel involved. From yes, the that was another yeah, takeaway. I like, um, you know, just to add to the, I really, you know, really think all of the firms could deliver a, a fabulous product at the end of the day, but I do think that from the standpoint of our previous experience and kind of the previous sins of the police station, that public relation piece or the ability to market or sell this and engage the community and not just with a town hall per se, but like using the various forms of social media, the the idea of going to the PTO, which Dorian Ritter had mentioned, I thought was way outside the box, but an absolute because as well as we're sitting here at town meeting, we'll get 300 people maybe. And if you did a town hall, we get 30, but we got 12,000 citizens and we got to convince people that this is a need and engage them and, you know, have them feel like their voice was heard, have them feel like they had a platform to be able to to share and I think um, I think what it comes down to is that that's going to be one of the biggest challenges I think um, 
you know, I think they all have the process down. I think they all have thorough knowledge of, you know, the bid process. They have thorough knowledge of how to go through this and to minimize change orders and, you know, but when it comes down to it, who's going to be able to market it the best? And I really felt like the approach of uh, Dorian Witter, but also Tecton, those were the two that I rated one and two, but Dorian Witter seemed to have that kind of capacity and, and I don't know, it seemed like they just had a grasp of, hey, we, we're going to reach out to this group, we're going to reach out to that group, we're going to go, like, they had a bunch of strategies while they didn't come out and say, hey, we're going to address it, they did come out and say, look, we've got a ton of strategies and we, we have a way in which we want to go about this where we get as much exposure as possible and try to engage as many people as possible to, to, to educate them about this and what we're trying to do and get done. I'll tell you, it wasn't a public safety uh, experience, but had a very positive experience with Dorn Whittier, Pawtucket Middle High School project regional high school, three towns, each had a third of the kids, very different towns from a, a you know, economics background, three very different constituents, and at the end, of the, end the project passed, I want to say, by the average vote of 90-something percent, yeah, and that was, it was awesome. And again, a lot goes to the, to the towns and the support group, but you know, they were a big role in the, the town meetings and the visioning sessions. It's obviously a little bit different than when you're doing, doing a school versus a, a fire station, but owning the process and being part of it did a wonderful job. They really did. I, uh, my thought process, or like the things I was looking at, uh, really sustainability. So my four and my five didn't even mention it at all. Um, my two and three kind of mentioned it in like sort of passing. Um, two talked about life cycle analysis of the HVAC equipment, which is great. That's a state minimum requirement, but on municipal, it's, it's good to talk about it. But what Dorian and Whittier, where they really stood out to me was when they talked about life cycle costs with short term, mid term, long term. Um, and I just really like the way that, that they think about it. You know, you're investing in a building, it's, it's not meeting a lead, it's not meeting the minimum of requirement. Um, that really impressed me. That That's what have them ahead for me. And that's kind of why I kind of knock the other companies out. I'll throw my two cents in. I'll try not to repeat. Um, I, I think Tecton, Doran Warrior were head and shoulders above context. Uh, I, I think context is a smaller company, maybe doesn't have the resources that uh, I think we think we need for this project. Uh, picking up on a lot of what the chief has said here as well um, and just some other sort of points of fact I make them what you will but Doran Whittier has done work here in town on both the middle school and the high school don't know if that's good or bad um, in terms of the architect's voice on the board um, I thought their their breadth of architecture was a little bit more uh, detailed and probably Norfolk related uh, than some of the others. Uh, and it was the only presentation in which I sort of, I wrote, you know, it was kind of impressive. I, I was a little surprised. Um, and some thoughts on Tecton. Um, I thought they gave the best, interestingly, gave the best group presentation because it was driven by one member but I thought that member effectively tried to get the rest of the folks to respond, whereas some of the others had a very different approach to that. It was either dictated, you know, it was, you know, right, now it's your turn, now it's your turn, now it's your turn, or it was a single speaker who dominated the entire thing. So I thought they presented as a team the best. Um, I also think Tecton gave the best answer to the contractor conflict question. Um, I think a lot of a lot of firms dodged it a little bit or just said, you know, we it's it happens, we deal with it. You know, I, I think they gave examples and talked about their process for dealing it, and not only for dealing with it, but getting out in front of it as well. So. 
So, you know, I, as I'm sitting here trying to decide between the one and two, I don't know, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. But I, I'll circle back to my first statement, which is, is I think, I think Tacton and uh, Dorian Warrior were both, I would have no problem cutting to two, I guess is my point. <clears throat> <laughs> but, All right, then we don't want to hear. Both, both of them, I, I focused on, on the specifications because, as uh, Tecton said today, that can you know make or break something from a contractual standpoint. Um, both Doran, Whittier, and Tecton had a similar approach to you know, what, what we use at my company, which is uh, we call it a consultant reviewer, where sometimes someone, a principal outside of the project that has no real involvement, will take the documents and review it. Um, kind of catch all those things that someone who's heavily involved in the project might not catch and you know that's gonna it's gonna help save change orders and conflicts down the road uh, so yeah, I again not gonna help narrow it down but I think they're they both have a strong approach to that yeah I also can't narrow it down really between the two of them I did rank Don and Whittier first but I didn't know if that was because of their first one and then Tecton came in second but I felt like Tecton definitely had the best team dynamic that they were presenting and I felt like they would be the most all involved throughout the entire process. But I did start to feel like their lead was kind of turned into a salesman towards the end of it. So I didn't know if I should be put off by that or not. So, uh, but I did, I did like their approach, especially with the contractors. I feel like they had the most, like I said, they would be the most involved and the best advocates for us. But in the end, I don't know how much that is going to be a difference between the two of them. Dorian Whittier had the most votes, and yeah. I said I was so tight for me, I would be willing to say that Dorian Whittier was number one if that helped everyone yeah, get I'd, to that point. I, I didn't rank Dorian Whittier number one in, in the process. I think I had context down again as number one. But like I, I said, I, I, I really thought, I mean, Dorian Whittier in this process really kind of rose in my rankings. I think, I think my initial rankings had them five out of the five, and now, you know, I had them two or three. Do you so those I, top two get any fairs that we have to Well, and I guess is there any, are there any other <laughs> insights that you, that you have into either company that might split them a little bit? The, the only thing, and I'll bring it up because they're in, in second, we just have the uh, job in Natick, beautiful project, and the ales in that building are architecture they're fantastic I mean they're like the little little things that you wouldn't think about you know the way the floor turns out for cleaning just certain things great stuff the issue we had on that job was the MEP consultant um, the particularly the electrical uh, it was one of our we sent it to I sent it to our own guy he gave it the fare um, and it was under the document piece because of because of the consultant. So that's really, I think, the only one that, that, that comes out in this, but that's the kind of thing that you could say, hey, we just live this with you, who you propose instead. So if you really wanted Tecton, I would say you would allay that fear by saying, who's your other, you know, the, it's not always one consultant, that you always have someone else so that everyone doesn't get the work. There's always a, a, like a, a couple that they'll go to. Um, and I would have that frank conversation and bring that up and say, hey, the committee liked you, but we have this concern. Um, but of course, we don't want them to bring in someone completely different that they haven't worked with. Sure. Right. It's got to be yeah, someone definitely. that they have the history on. Or, or the consultant specifically, it was electrical that I believe we had the majority of the issues with. Um, that doesn't mean you can't ask for that person to not be on the team, to lead that team. You know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. You know, usually it's it's never the same person. Those are three specific disciplines. Yeah. So you could, I don't know who the person was. I don't know the name. I mean, I did kind of like that Tecton didn't show us a schematic or how they're going to position it on the site. And they said that they're going to approach the ad reno from a life cycle analysis as of just like, a, is the building salvageable or not? I felt that like that was a more thorough process. But I mean, I, I know which way I'm kind of leaning on the ad reno versus new. I think we're probably all in the same boat there, so I don't know how much that really matters in the end. Okay. When you let that 
they bring to this kind of a compilation of everything they know from what's out there. And it's sometimes you have to be careful just because they went down a road to show you something. The process hasn't started yet. This is them doing it without seeing you. I've seen that work opposite on an architect once coming to an interview, coming up and it was for a library and they said, look, this is something we could do. Turned off half the committee so badly they didn't, they weighed on on the list and it was like, guys, this <laughs> wasn't the solution. It was just them showing you that they <laughs> took what they saw in the community and showed you something. So something like that, if they're, you know, I think everybody we saw acknowledges that there is an ad reno potential and there is a new potential. Mm -hmm. How that plays out, that's yet to come. They've got to sit and talk to Chief, talk to you, and say, you know, it's the specifics about how do we make it work, how do we make the facilities operate. That's then, after they talk about that, they'll be able to actually show show us the, the different phasing options and, you know, we'll make that decision in this SD process. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't think that's a very long conversation. Yeah. <laughs> being, being candid and honest. Well, but they don't know until they get here. There right, might be right, some right. Yeah. burning love for this building right. by the community that we all don't understand. And if we, if we decide to can it, people are going to be furious. I don't know. Well, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I to change the design because the town people, the residents, wanted to keep a building that we deemed. Right, it happens. And it, 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 changed, it changed the location of the building. Oh, we're not changing the location. We're getting off topic here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to the, you know, a lot of the questions asked and, and the answers that were given, you know, we, we need to educate the town as to why we're doing what we're doing. And I mean, I, I think a lot of us here are thinking we're going to come out and the renovation doesn't make a lot of sense. but. I mean, I'm in fashion and every job I go into where someone comes in with a building, they're like, well, renovating is cheaper than building new. And I can't remember the last time I went into a project where a renovation project actually, where we finished it and said, you know what, that was cheaper than if we'd done it new. It, it always was like, man, it ended up being just as much, if not more. Right. So it, again, that's just kind of like that perception that, so it might not be the right thing to do, but we have to to their point here, we have to prove yes. and get the data behind why it's not the right thing to do. You know, For sure. And, and move on. I so that'll help us too in the, the from the transparency <laughs> part and also from the, the standpoint of being able to educate the people, our citizens that are going to be voting on this, if they have an understanding as to why, hey, Renault does not work because of X, Y, and Z, it's much easier to justify the new than just to say, oh, we're doing new. And then be like, well, why didn't you look into? So I think looking into it and getting the information is critically important. I think it helps the overall success potential for it. And that's part, a big part of the process in this first phase, especially to show like, no, we did look at it, and it is not cheaper. If they're going to look at costs and us having to go ask for money, you say no, it wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been cheaper, and it wouldn't have been better. That's why the community, all of them have talked about community outreach to a certain degree. And you don't wait till town meeting to answer that question. Like, this is a very, in my mind, very methodical approach to, you know, the new designer comes on board, starts to chew on stuff, starts to come up with add new, whatever. That first public information session is about new or renovate. And in that way, when you start on that path of, let's say it's new, <coughs> you put away right now, it's gone. Like, we're gonna talk about it again at town meeting, say we addressed it. And as you recall, we had this community information session, and we put all this stuff out there. And here's why, and you can revisit it then. But you know, you're gonna there's multiple forks in a road in this process. And once you go, you commit. You know, you got to go on it. So, so don't wait to tell folks about that. Tell them about it as the decisions are being made or getting close to being made. Hey, do you have any feedback on that? Get some questions. Boil that into the, the rest of the study. Then people at least feel listened to. Hey, they answered my question. You know, and at the end of the day. You know, we all end up at the same place anyway than where I think the chief's going with it right now, but at least <laughs> at least you've shaken it out, you know. So um, so after the discussion, does anybody want to change their ranking at all? I can change mine to D and W. You don't have to. No. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay with either one. No, but I, think, I mean well the result I, 
the stone first. Yeah, the results aren't going to really. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, oh. uh, seven. Yeah, I mean, and them is first. So it's it's nobody's made a really compelling argument at Tecton to each other that you well, why you should flip that decision. Yeah, but not everybody had them one. We revoted. That's what I was just going to say: is do we want to revote and just go with who gets more first place votes? I, and I have one more question too. Um, so I'm digging through the data here, and I'm not finding it. But how about work on the books? Right? They're both similarly sized firms. Does one of them have significantly more work? And that's in our RFP, isn't it? Usually, yeah. I think that's, I think yeah, like that's we, part we of the standard. We can't have the firm that doesn't have time to do our work. Yeah. Which was a uh, problem with the police station. Yeah, it's, it's back in here. Yeah, I, mean, I think they had like a big spreadsheet on the RFP, yeah, no, right, that explained. Yeah. You have them there? I can bring the no, hard he's, copies he's down right upstairs. I need to do this. Yeah, just look at the total staff. Back, can we just go back? They're both the around 50. Right, but I, I think it's total staff compared with how, ma how many projects they have on the books, right? So Doran Whittier is 57, and you scroll down to current project list. So now that you bring that up, Aaron, um, Tecton did have kind of an interesting answer to Steve's they were the only one that really kind of expanded on the design team, and they did kind of throw out, well, we might bring in more people if if the workload requires it, which makes you think they might be thinking a little bit that they might need to bring in more people, you know? Yeah, and that gets to my, my comment about that either one of them is big enough that they could do that, whereas I'm not sure context is, right? That context yeah. didn't have that bench. Yeah, I, I think, is really everyone good. on the same page? We've narrowed it down to two, at, at least. That's pretty awesome. Though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty good for a 15-minute discussion, right? Yeah. yeah. Like I said, I mean. It's probably just throwing numbers out. <laughs> yeah, right. It was pretty close for me, between all of them. Well, it's a well-matched committee. If individually, yeah. we all came to similar conclusions without even having to discuss it. It all go this smoothly. Hopefully, that's going <laughs> yeah, mean, to carry so, us through the. Uh, so interestingly, I, I mean, decisions. I was I was kind of writing this out. So I have what my rankings were, the RFP rankings, and then what the math came out to, right? And it, it was um, it was one three one and two 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 for these two firms. So I mean, they were clearly our two favorite firms right, from made, made the all, all three yeah. measure points. So. Six, seven, including the house yeah. All right, now if you can go to the... Looks like Dorn Woodier's got six or seven ongoing projects, two of which look to be house doctor contracts. So, small again? house doctor. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> it's a house doctor contract for the U.S. Postal Service. So, a post office in, you know, Brockton says, hey, we want to put in a bathroom. They call them and they... It's usually not big fee work. Right. It's, usually it's small, okay. small like, jobs and they, and they might not even get much out of it. Okay. We just talk all the time and never get a phone call. That's not my world. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to. States got state agencies use it all They're going to. They have a ongoing. Well, it's like free cash in the world. <laughs> a little bit. They also have because, the ongoing Boston Fire work, Station, and which, which closes up. Negotiating the, the contracts are so difficult. Supposedly. It takes such a long time. So that was a good It doesn't make sense to negotiate paperwork. all of that paperwork every time you want to pick a, a, new, a new carpet. I wouldn't yeah. think along so those lines. So what they do is they get house doctor like teams the team so that if they want to pick a carpet, detail, they just like say, anyone clearly miss the mark? Well, for $1,000, you know, pick a new carpet. Okay. Thanks. I learned something new today. Yeah. Glad the short solar was not there because I was hard to talk by the architect. It's actually not for thousand dollars. It's for oh, whatever. Sure, sure, it's, sure. it's for whatever your established right. billing rate is. Right. right. Whatever billing you have rate we agree to. an established contractual relationship. You just design. might do something different. Oh, yeah. this, this week it's carpet. Next week it's a bathroom. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Got it. He came as a two and a half million dollar house doctor contract. Got it. Yeah, I was worried about that. Like, do they let municipalities have house doctor like, contracts? What if they? So. Oh yeah. What if people well, know about the architects? It's really a, it like goes through a board. The board <laughs> and it selects <laughs> what agencies or what firms are on the house doctor contract. contract. So it goes, it goes okay. through like that. So I'll give you the numbers. So yeah. Doran Whittier has 57 architects, 
They currently have 17 active projects totaling 387 million. Okay, I can speak to, as an example, one of the jobs we're working on with them right now, the construction is 118 of that millions, and there is one person who's over, who overlaps on that team. What's Gio that Giovanna, that's the Pentucket Middle High School project. Giovanna does, does doing the furniture procure, design and procurement for that. So that's that. And then Tecton is 50 people. They have nine active projects uh, worth 93 million right now. And what is, do you, who has more fire stations overall, do you think? Or are they completely matched? I think D and W had more. <laughs> I think I'm just curious. Is one Tecton done only had like four or five yeah. true fire stations on there. Fire stations during winter it definitely has one. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah. compelling. They keep getting work. Right. And they did Medfield. They were Medfield, I think. Yeah. yeah. They did Medfield. Um, uh, Carver. Well, Carver's is beautiful. Carver's, Carver's is one of the yeah. nicest fire stations I've ever seen. Uh, Westwood. Really nice. Westwood, Westwood Center. Oh, they solved, they solved the Westwood problem, right? Because yes. they Is, Islington Center there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, where was it Dedham? Where that one lost and they had to... Dedham. Dedham. They're also doing Dedham public safety Dedham. right now. We're on that one with them, too. So between Pentucket okay, and that I'm job, sorry. that's almost okay. 200 million of the 380-something. <laughs> and it's, again, the Dedham team. Is but no, they came is in when Dedham, there. somebody else has screwed it up and kind of help pull it back out of the ashes, wasn't that the one where they they somebody they couldn't get a town meeting vote? I think it was and they had yeah, to come back. Yeah, I think we had to go back for ten million that, dollars. That was yes. Vertex's interview. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so many interviews. We went back. We, we came they, in after. That was their selling point. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we can only up, hire one person on that. that. <laughs> We'll keep the team We're going to hire everybody for that job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the help sellers. Nice right, guys. That's good. What was the community um, thoughts on the middle school there in Pawtucket or Pentucket? The, 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 was that like a hard sell, or is there, were they pretty much like, oh yeah, 180 million, let's go for it? Uh, total co cost of the building was 118. Total project 146. Uh, communities. multiple communities. Um, it was such a good discussion and such a transparent discussion that again the three separate town meetings all voted it over 90 percent passing rate. Which if you had told me that when we first met I wouldn't have believed you. So it was it was a very good it was a very good job but it, but again I don't want to oversell Gordon Rudy did their part but the everybody did their part. I mean it was really one of the most successful campaigns I think I've ever seen which is great I kind of generally think education is an easier sell than fire protection so. there's no question <laughs> I've rarely seen schools not be so which one do you think on that point of education which one do you think can move quickly if we need to because I had a meeting with the with, the, with their superintendent yesterday just to catch up and we were talking about these two projects I said look I'm you know just for me hoping we can move this along even possibly to get to a fall town meeting a year from this November because I don't want it to be come at the same time as the school because I want both projects to be successful right. and that one depending on MSBA might come a little later so no, I, I, listen you have the you have the, the luxury of having your design fees all set which is wonderful so to design a building like this in a year is doable should, right. be, should be doable and I would tell you that either of them could do it Okay. Again, they would need to confirm that. I mean, that would all be confirmed. It would be in their proposal. It would be in the contract. We're going to set up, you know, we were going to set up a, a deliver, a, you know, deliverable dates of those phases. You know, when you want the estimates. You know, because remember, you're also contracting with them just for SD right now. But we need to. So we need to have feasibility. Feasibility. Yeah. Just feasibility. Yeah. Yes. Excuse me. So keeping them moving will be largely on this committee to keep them moving, yep. you know what I mean? So to lay out the pricing and not lose a week every time we do a transition, there's four transit, you know, we're gonna lose a month between yep. starting and stopping. Um, but I think if communicating to 
whichever firm that's the goal to get to town meeting what what month would it be November which is great so if I would tell you if it's November I will I want you to go to town meeting with bids in hand I want you to design it and bid it because there's no better number to give to the town than the actual number I understand you know and with, that may plus help contingencies our case. obviously yeah. it definitely helps case from a fuzzy math standpoint <laughs> Huh? We're going to need it. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> How do we know the contractor's not going to charge us more? Well, aside from, well, here's we have a contract for this. And here's PlayStation, they told us it was going to cost X, and I don't know if it costs They have finished yeah. design. <laughs> and, 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 and we made these decisions based on this. we got to do it different this time. Yeah. If, uh, if D&W CAC and their dates are wildly outside of our scope, does that can, are we allowed to go ask uh, Tecton to see what theirs are? Yeah, so the way this works is you, I'm just ignorant of the process, I'm sorry. You're, just, you're making a decision purely qualifications based, and then you solicit a cost proposal from them. And if in that cost proposal, they're dig part of that is their schedule. If they say, they say, Justin, we can't, we can't get a job ready to bid until, you know, January of 23. Well, obviously, that's going to cause problems for us. So that comes out in, in this part. It's not impossible. It's just that you know, we're just adding no, a town no, meeting. No, no, no. Listen, if that, but if that's the goal, and again, that's something new you just learned. So we would, you know, if that suddenly throws them off and go, man, we can't do that. We we want to know that early because then if you can't reach an agreement to terms with the, the highest ranked, you go to number two. Can't get to number two, you go to number three. We've, I don't think we've ever not been able to come to agreement with a number one. But it can occasionally happen for something just like that. Resources. If you were asking for something within five months, like something crazy, not obviously for a brand new building or some shortened duration, you know, maybe somebody would pull themselves out and go, "We just got another job. We really can't do it." But I would bet most most firms are going to be able to work with your schedule because that's not an unrealistic schedule to try to go to bid a year from now. You know where it's going. You know the lane, like you know what I mean. If we were trying to do site selection and all of that too, different story. You know where this building is going, um, and that's a big plus. And you own it already too. They're scheduled to bid. Not that this is in stone, but twenty four to six months for feasibility. Three months schematic design. Three months. Six months, it's two months. Yeah. It's a discussion. <laughs> no, seriously. No, it's a great point. It's a great point. And you know, but again, that schedule is based on yeah, what was given to them. Sure. If, if we had put in the RFQ that you need to be ready to come to come to dance with the bids in hand by fall of next year. I'm going to tell you that probably they all would have applied and you would have interviewed all of them and they all would have probably told you the same that they could get it done. Um, so I kind of feel like we could sit here and continue to talk about the two of them or we could just vote again and go with the math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, is there a football game on? Uh, there is, but that's, that, that doesn't have anything to do with it. So I'm just going to uh, suggest we just bid and, and go with who gets the most number ones. Mm -hmm. So let me with just those two. Should be like Survivor. <laughs> I gotta figure out how I'm gonna do this smart too. One and a half. No rules. <laughs> one and a half, one and a half. It yeah. Really tough. Really tough. <clears throat> I, I mean, I, it's a good problem to have. I don't I think there's really a, a, a wrong answer to be perfectly no. honest. No. Yeah, I think so. we're in, it's a good, it's like some, somebody just said it's a great problem to have. Yeah. Depth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go through this in order that I have your names. Okay, Chris, who's one? Doran Whittier. Okay, Kevin. Doran Whittier. Aaron. Tech Tom. John. Doran Whittier. Chief. Doran Live. Doran Whittier. Justin. Doran Whittier. Oh. <laughs> one of these things is <laughs> only one architect on the board. No, which <laughs> is important. That's a great point. So, with uh, six number ones, it's Doran Whittier, 
1.14 and Tecton 1.86. Forward is the, the things that make you not have story with her first, the tech one first. Yeah. If we can carry those forward so that we try to bring them up in the conversation, yeah. make sure that we address it. You know, the point about the community engagement where some of them had some really good ideas, I think that's good to keep in mind. All right, so. Do you guys need a vote to memorialize this to authorize? I guess you'll have me reach out to them for a yeah. So we'll we'll vote to begin negotiations with. Yeah, here's a motion that I'd scripted. You know, to fill be filled in. Okay. So, uh, agenda item number three: Please consider selecting a firm for designer services and beginning negotiations. So. We've already voted. Uh, can I get a motion that the committee vote to select uh, Doran Whittier as the designer for the fire station renovation rehabilitation, renovation rehabilitation project and authorize the chair, vice chair, and town administrator to begin contract negotiations? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, great. Do we need to, um, why don't we'll do the minutes next. Yeah. Um, so please consider approval of the minutes. Of Chris, August 24th and oh, September 9th. Yes. Yeah, sorry, 26th. Uh, okay, just, just check. September yeah, 9th. sorry, I had another meeting that night, so. <laughs> All right, uh, can I get a motion for approval of the, uh, the minutes from the August 26th and September 9th meetings? So moved. Second. 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 Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I know we did that vertex. We kind of said we won't come back to the committee if it falls inside this range. Well, I guess I turned. I'd ask um, John. Should we wait to get posed to a meeting, or how do you think this best goes? This is going to come down to, you could ask all five of the proposals and you would get an apple, an orange, a grape, a grapefruit as far as services that they would include. I think you first want to see if they have any questions about documents that we have because you don't want them pricing things, you know, if you already have a survey or those kind of things, pricing things that you already have information on. So what I would say is we notify them give them the heads up after a phone call see if you have any questions you know if you have any questions and then let them let them go and let's see what they you know let's see what they get back as you know if you try to you know where's the FSSD line what percentage of the fee you know you're probably better getting it in front of you um, and then having a quick meeting to talk about it if we have to to, to find it. We can check it against lots of data as far as what the FS portion of a total potential $10 million project. You know, if you're $10 million project, it's probably ultimately around a million dollar fee. Okay, what percentage of that million dollars is feasibility? Is it 10%? Is it 8%? Like, are we in the ballpark? Are we in the ballpark? Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I'm trying to think how to say this. Well, we didn't, as of right now, we don't have another meeting planned, right? No, no. I mean, we would meet the second um, Monday of the month, but we're, you know, that's already passed. And I had, I had naively hoped we could get to the October 5th select board meeting with a contract and a, here's who we're hiring. That might, that's. I mean, look, you know, is, is 10%, like, 
is a hundred thousand dollars a a not to exceed number that the committee wants to entertain to see uh, I mean, that's we where we were headed right so i mean that's yeah. kind of how we did i think that's we kind of came to that vote as long as it was under this number we were fine yeah. with yeah. you guys we never had that conversation for this yeah. Yeah, so right. i think what we're saying maybe maybe we need to have that conversation now so we can all vote yeah i mean and, you know you saw in, in the slides you know 10 to 12 you know 10 10 million but that's what we put in the RFP. No, right, but yeah, but just the di just the difference in fee though right. at yeah, at ten percent. Never mind eleven nine. You know that ten percent is either a hundred, um, you know, a million or one point two million. Ten percent of those numbers is either a hundred thousand or a hundred twenty thousand. You know, is a hundred and twenty the number? So if we get a proposal for under that. This committee's okay right, so with that. Like that's the. So let's let's talk that out, right? So let's just make sure we're all on the same page there. We're, we we've said we think this is between a ten and a twelve million dollar project, right? Yeah. So you know, ten percent is is the soft costs, I guess, is what we're saying. Right? Architects, fee. architects fee. Architects fee. So, um, are are we negotiating the entire fee now? No, and that's that's the tricky part. Just the feasibility. What, what percentage of that entire hundred percent of the architects fee? Is earmarked for that little piece of feasibility study in the beginning. Right, but we know that Probably. that piece is pretty important. It's Correct. important, so. but isn't it also the lost leader? Like they want to get the rest of the job, so they're gonna besides besides the, the testing they need to do, maybe having other people right, there's do. The basic service, then the reimbursable piece, right? Yeah. So it isn't 10 percent at the beginning, but it really needs to be during SD through the rest. Right, but if we but if we said if the if the fee request comes in at one to one point two million or lower, then we're good to negotiate. That well, it, it's not going to come in at that amount because it's going to be ten percent of ten percent because we're only or negotiating whatever, right, or whatever the number is. Yeah. Right. So like a hundred thousand. And they need. So say it comes in under two hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we could pick a number. We'll it's going to. We could say it comes in under two hundred thousand dollars. The committee's comfortable with this moving forward. Right? This is just feasibility, so it's definitely right. going to come out of that. Well, I, I think it's something, because we, we made a motion that, that you, I, myself, and Blythe can negotiate with them. I think it's just a matter of, is there a number where John, Justin, and Chris wants to come back and, a committee discussion. and have a committee discussion? Or do we say, if it comes in less than $150,000, then we can negotiate from there? I think it, I mean, I, again, I'm brand new to this whole process, but I, it sounds like to me that it's very important to or at least attempt to keep on our schedule. So if we're looking, uh, did you say it was October 5th? The selectmen meet the 5th and 19th of October, so I'm trying to hit those dates, which really only gives us next week to negotiate this, and that's not much time. We have, they haven't even seen, they've seen a draft of the contract, but we don't know if they have issues, you know, we don't know any of that. But here's the thing, the statutorily, really, you're not supposed to negotiate the terms of the contract. The contract is kind of is what it is. You put it out there and they saw it, and they're yeah. really supposed to just sign it. If they had an issue with it, should have brought it up. There shouldn't be a lot of, okay. they, they, may, they may suggest, hey, could we look at this, and maybe council has to look at a term or two, but the, the, this is not a negotiated contract. The contract okay. That's that's part of the public public procurement part of this, you know. Um, Aside from making sure the scope is scope's the most right. Scope's really important, but the the, the, the legal lease should be set already. Yeah, council I mean, looked at that. I knew council made one little edit to it on the warranty, but that's yeah. It. I mean, yeah. I don't have a lot of reference to understand how much feasibility or any of these things should cost. But to me, the hundred and fifty thousand doesn't seem outrageous for a comprehensive study of the project and how it's going to go and I, I think it's worth expending that equity with the community to do our due, dil due diligence through this whole process. Oh, and we're not going to, yeah, we're not giving them that, I mean they may of watch course. it on YouTube, yeah. but right. you know, <laughs> you know, ultimately give us your proposal and let's see that they understand that they're aiming for this bite, that next bite SD is real, where we're going to set kind of the wheels in motion as far as this is a $12 million job, or this is a or construction cost, okay. and all the rest of the costs on top of that. But speaking to the process, remember our conversation was is we wanted to spend some money up front to prove out what the rest of the project was, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of where we are in this process. We need to spend some money up front to figure out what the rest of the process is. So, I mean, I guess we don't necessarily have to vote on a number, right? You guys could just, we could just vote no. tonight to say, 
the three of you figure it out and get to the yeah, get it to the select board by which is right. which is basically what we did. I guess it's just matter of like we want everybody to be comfortable. To with me, yeah. you know, I don't personally, you know, I think it's going to come in more than that number. And I think if it was at that number, it might be a little a little on the high side. But just yeah, say, all right, if it's under that, then we don't. I but the other thing uh, is, is we if it comes in and it's a higher number than name is expect, then we say we got to have a meeting. Yeah. 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 Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I think and I misspoke. We have two weeks next week and the week after sort this out before. I mean, yeah. if you say go, I mean, I'll call Dawn on the ride home and say get cracking on this tomorrow morning, like get moving. If you well, it helps them understand that you know we would like yeah, to move with you know with with purpose. Yep. The other benefit of having them is they where they do do a bunch of schools. They will understand the timing you're up against very specifically with the other project, kind of, because that's their other half of their world is building schools. So they, they get the, you know, they, the stuff you're going to be up against in the MSBA and the time. So. Yep. On costs, I've always had in my mind a breakdown of study, design, and construction admin 363. And it sounds like we're going to be way under that. Estimated construction cost 3%. I think we're going to be way under that. So I'm fine with. You guys well, three percent, six percent. Yeah, three percent. I don't know if that's outdated or where that even came from, but um, I've always had that in my head, and it sounds like we're going to be nowhere near that. So yeah, I mean, I think when you look at that first three percent, it's probably also schematic, schematic design, as well. Right. So we're 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 doing the it's usually FS slash SD. You guys broke it down to just to make sure you've got the right team here, FS only, and then we'll give them the rest. And then after SD, you're going to give them all a design. You know, and then CA is contingent upon approval by the by the town. Okay, so one fifty would probably be like because because you're you're going to have subs like some some of their subs MEP structure they're only going to come and look at the existing building to write maybe a report on. Mm -hmm. They're not going to really do, do an any existing work. condition survey. They're not going to do any design work in this phase. Right. Adequacy of the systems, that sort of stuff, to help you make vision of where's the ledge. Use it or burn it, and where's the ledge. And that's the other piece. There's the basic services, that, and then there's the subcontracted. I shouldn't say subcontracted. The, we got to go get a driller to do this. They'll own the geotech who will interpret that, but the actual work of the, the drill rig is it two holes? Is it three holes? Is it six holes? That may be an evolving number depending on what they find when they get out here. Test pits. How many test pits? That kind of thing. And. Please chime in if I'm misspeaking. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. And I, I was even going to ask at some point, you know, are we okay, you know, eventually once we get that rolling to like recommend things that we know to them as far as other method, methods of investigation to look for the ledge specifically? Uh, oh, I think anything is fair. I mean, that's, as I said, that's why the guys are on the, like, if there's feedback to give these guys, Give it to them. Listen, the reality is that if you like them, you know you're building something there. Yeah. So spending more money now, like if, if suddenly the geotech data number became higher in FF, don't get don't yeah. get locked into that's infeasibility. Oh no. No, that's data you're gonna use for the duration of the, yeah. the design process. So even though maybe it makes a heavy feasibility phase dollars, the data is the data. You're gonna use that data FS through Design development through construction documents. You you've got it and you own it. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's cheaper methods because the bedrock's so shallow to scan scan the site or these you know corners of it and, and get depth you know across it rather than need, needle and haste yep. all over the place. So so do we need to vote to figure out the the process here to get to a contract or is that are we set? Up I now? think you're set. I just think we giving us them feedback for the three of us of where we might end up is what I want to make sure just everyone's comfortable with that. Yeah, I think in the interest of time to, you know, to get it rolling, that, that's the way to go. I mean, like you said, if they come back with something like wildly inappropriate for a fee, <laughs> then, you know, we'll, we'll discuss it at that point. I don't... We have a really close number two. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I'll tell them that too. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it happening either. I, I think Four tenths different. <laughs> We're done. I'll make a motion or ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. 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 Aye. Aye. Aye.
guys, just just for the record, for Blythe, how about you? Can you guys give me all of your score sheet or your comment sheets? Right? Yep. We want to keep. Found it. And then now we're in limbo.